Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting Jim Cornette experience where today we're going to talk about the biggest night in the history of our sport and the lackluster nights that are leading up to it, plus the crime report, the life of the American nightmare, and a month in my life from 40 years ago. And to join me in all this and so much more, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. He's the greatest co-host in the history of our podcast. The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. And I don't know, there was someone else that was all right. Maybe. Right? <laughs> anyway. Well, it's nice to be here, as I said. Yeah, it's good, good of you to show up. You know, people don't want to show up for work these days, from what I hear. They're always just, oh, let me send in a pre-tape. Well, actually, I'm, bro I'm broadcasting from outside the hospital, as we <laughs> speak. <laughs> You wouldn't know it, but trust me, it's outside the house. Oh, a beer. You're you're broadcasting from the other side of the garage door. <laughs> That's right. And and the grass is always greener there. Um anyway, we're gonna talk about all that stuff today, but what we've got a at the top of the program, because he deserves it. One of the OG members of the cult of Cornette is having a shitty time. Did, did you know John Fell in Baltimore? Got a new family member. What? No, I did not know this, and I, I'm afraid of what you're going to say here. Yes, he got a new family. John Fell got a new family member. Tree fell on his fucking house. He had a tree fall on his house. This is John's luck. But gloom, despair, and agony. Oh, me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony owe me. Yeah. To make it, it worse, a, you're singing. A tree fell on his house, and then his daughter got in a car accident. She's okay. Because but of the tree? Uh, no, no, not because of the, It was separate incidents. Because that'd be amazing if, like, the tree fell in the middle of the road, and then the daughter swerved into, like, the neighbor's house. <laughs> and then the house caught on fire and blew up. <laughs> the, neighbor's, the neighbor's wife flew through the roof and landed on the family dog. Uh, but no. Then he but could change she, his name to John Explodes in Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> I haven't even got to the rest of his misery. And no, come on now. We're not trying to make, John, we love you. We're not trying to make fun of your misfortune or ill fortune or whatever, but your daughter's car is fucked and the roof apparently of the house is fucked. And it, it, anyway, John's, his wife has been sick. Hope she's feeling better now. But John, just remember the plague of locusts, stock up on umbrellas. You'll be fine. But we want all the members of the cult of Cornette to send our their best, our best, everybody's best, the best you got, folks, to John Fell, the nicest man in the world. He's not the most interesting man in the world because he doesn't have that ascot and that gray hair like Al Haft, but he's the nicest man in the world. But he's interesting because he may not be directly doing it, but he's standing there while the tree falls and the car crashes and the house blows up. He's just standing there watching it all. He's got something to say. And nothing falls on him. Apparently, he's fallen enough with his name of Fell. He falls. I wonder if he's related to Norman Fell. I don't know. Have you ever wondered that? I've Apparently never wondered not. that until this very moment. No. Well, I've, I, that's the first thing. As soon as as I met him, that's the first thing I wondered. Is but I didn't want to ask him. I was afraid there's heat in the family. Norman was an oddball, from what I can tell. Um, here's another shout out to another of the original members of the cult of Cornette, Charlie from Starkville, Mississippi. Did you hear about this, this land, this landmark, I started to say landmine, this landmark. This, this landmine listener of ours who sends oh, in this, these questions that blow up all over No, the there's a family, now I can't say it, land, a family milestone coming up, not landmine. A family landmine. A family <laughs> landmine is coming up. Right down the road. <laughs> should we just should we start again from the top or just <laughs> continue this and hope people forgive us every once in a while? Uh Charlie from Starkville says his parents are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary this week, which 
And the, the email was sent uh, August 14th. So which, whenever you're hearing this, they either have or are about to or just did celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. And he wanted to make sure we marked that landmine here on the program. Congratulations. Both, uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I muddled over your congratulations. Now I take it back. Am I congratulating him or am I congratulating them? Well, you're congratulating them. It's not their fault. They had no idea that when they committed the innocent act of getting married, that one of the omissions of that would be Charlie from Starkville. It wasn't their fault. You know what may fix everyone's problem? Like a wife swap kind of thing where for six months we get John Fell in Starkville and Charlie from Baltimore. They get to live the other one's lives and learn some sort of lesson. But well, well now wait a minute. I don't know because. It wouldn't be wife swap. It would be family swap. You'd send. I said you'd like send wife swap. Well, you'd send Charlie up to, I guess, live with John's lovely wife, who has the patience of a saint. But you would send John down to live with Charlie's parents, help them celebrate their fiftieth wedding anniversary. Shuffleboard and, you know, water therapy and all that stuff you do on your fiftieth anniversary. Anyway, who would uh, who would get the family pets? What kind of pets? I I don't know the the population of all the animal kingdom in in Starkville and up in Baltimore, but I'm sure they have many. There's a lot of seafood. What? They don't have pet fucking lobsters. And if you eat seafood in Mississippi, you know what Mississippi basically the seafood that crawls up on the shores of Biloxi is the shit that was nimble and skinny enough to escape all the fishermen down in Florida. I don't know if you really want to eat that. Now, the the seafood up in, like, Corinth, Mississippi, or Tupelo, now that's that's to die for, literally. Are you are you still there? No, I'm letting, I'm letting you die in Tupelo. <laughs> <laughs> I got another email. It, it concerns you. Oh, okay. Because we we read an email from Barry. This Barry usually ends in, well. No, Barry in North Yorkshire, UK. I love their pudding. But we read an email. He had, had compiled statistics on Battle of the Belts, the AEW TV specials. And this was a show or two ago. And we he mentioned that of all of the specials they've had, only one time did a title really change hands. And then there was something with a vacant belt or whatever the fuck and you asked a question and the information was not contained within barry's email i can't remember what it was because i seldom listen to what you say to be honest but here barry has followed up on that to give you the information that you desired none so taken I, I well i can't remember exactly how you phrased this but apparently you were in in you were confused about how many total matches had been presented on the Battle of the Belts, and are they all for the belts? And the answer is there have been three matches on each of the seven Battles of the Belts, giving a total of 21 matches. <laughs> well, that's easy math, yeah. Which he as correctly identified by your good self, Jim. <laughs> but he says every match of the 21 matches was for some sort of title, so therefore a title match. And we, I have the breakdown here. Yeah, that's what I want. How many different championships? Okay, now, now you're being clear about what you want. When Barry's had to do all this research. This is the same guy that sent the first email? Yes. Oh, I didn't know if it was just someone who heard that segment and sent in an email you know, independent I said of Barry. It's the top of the, see, I said at the top of the program, he's clarifying this, or at the top of this email here. Well, maybe I don't listen to you either. Or at the top of here, can you hear this? Let me turn it up for you. You can't see that, but it's a finger. Hey. Anyway, the titles contested most on four occasions each. The TNT Championship, four times, including once as a vacated or interim title. The AEW Women's World title four times. Wait, can I stop you? Yes. Do you consider the interim championship different than the championship in terms of counting the different championships? Boy, that's a lot of fucking... I know. I know. I could say championship title like the fucking moron does on yeah, TV. Yeah, but... yeah. And, and the... Uh, anyway, I, I do consider... Except when it's... Again, 
the fucking muddle and confusion of all of these, you know, it, it, why, what's one more, right? If it was a big deal or something they're being is being pushed or when they were unifying with punk and the plumber or whatever the case. But nevertheless, the next uh, round, the AEW International Championship has been contested twice, but it was previously <laughs> named the All-Atlantic Championship, so that makes four times for that lineage of that prestigious title. Do you consider God. that two different titles, two different names? No, I consider it a goddamn joke from the start. So one joke, not two jokes. One joke, not two jokes. Same punchline. Literally, yeah. Literally. They made up a belt for the guy that Tony thinks is cute and dresses up like on Halloween. So whatever they call it. Then, Barry continues contested thrice. That means three times over, over in England. The AEW TBS Championship, that's three times. Contested twice. The ROH World Championship, the ROH Tag Team Championship, and contested once the AEW World Tag Team Championship and the FTW Championship, which he parenthetically uh, adds is an unrecognized title. You can't really even say that at this point. There's been more FTW appearances or defenses or just Jack Perry holding it up, whatever you want to say in the last several months than the TNT championship. Well, to be honest, all of them are unrecognized titles because if you hold the belt up from a fucking distance, nobody can recognize which one is which because they're all just a bunch of fucking belts. That'd be but a great TV. Every- that'd be a great show. Get 10 wrestlers and put them in a crowd of 150 wrestling fans and everyone holds up their belt. The ones they either have as wrestlers or the ones they bought on the internet. And some fan has to pick out who are the wrestlers and who are the fans. What about this? What about if you just take a hundred wrestlers and fucking put them up on a stage and get a thousand people in from goddamn Six Flags or the mall or wherever you can find them and have them look at the hundred wrestlers on a stage and tell us which ones they think are actually wrestlers and see how many people would think that one of these motherfuckers today is a professional wrestler or a goddamn out of work skateboarder. I think that's a great idea. Just remember I was on this call when you trademarked this trademark. Hey, how, so how many different championships was that? Well, there was 21 title matches. Of, uh, one, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different titles with nine different names. Eight different titles. How many of them are not official AEW championships? Uh, well, the TNT championship, I guess, is because it's is. their TV network. AEW Women's, AEW International, All Atlantic, Round the World in 80 days. <laughs> AEW TBS, uh, so Ring of Honor World. <laughs> what? Just the way you're reading off these names makes them all sound <laughs> ridiculous. I'm is, you know, if Ring of Honor World Title, World Tag Title, two, and FTW Title, if that qualifies, and then if all of the other ones actually are. <laughs> Good God. The TNT Title, the AEW Women's Title, the AEW International All Atlantic A and A and P fucking <laughs> T Company, AEW TBS Title. They've got one for each of their networks. Um, they better hope they don't have to go to some shitty network at some point. AEW World Tag Team, FTW, and they didn't even have the uh, trios. The trios. No trios. I, I was actually thinking we've seen on at least Dynamite a uh, a triple A titles. We've seen New Japan oh, yeah, titles. Yeah, so yeah. that's why I was thinking maybe we've seen some of them on Battle. We don't watch Battle of the Belts. We would know this maybe if we had. But well, they didn't have room for all of those titles because they had too many more belts battling of their own. And then when FTR were the champions, they had simultaneously the Japanese, the uh, AAA, the That's right. Everything but AEW, Ring of Honor. Did they defend Did they defend any of that on Battle of the Belts? Wait a minute, there's also a Ring of Honor TV champion. Yeah, Samoa Joe. 
And the, was there not, there's a Ring of Honor women's champion. There used to be. No, there still is Athena. Actually, people have been saying that she's doing great stuff there, I have to say. We haven't seen any of it, but I've heard a lot of people say that her stuff in Ring of Honor is better than anything in hmm. the main roster of uh, AEW. Athena? I don't know how much of her I've seen her. You see, there was another way you could have gone to make that rhyme work. Well, thank you. What would, what would it have been? You know, all these years, you know, it's 2023 right now. There's an article in the New York Post like yesterday about how Roger Daltrey and Pete Townsend still don't get along at all. <laughs> <laughs> the two, the only members of the Who Left, the two, and they don't get along. Well, you and me are about to follow in that category. I've got one more email here that I'm going to read. And this is, by the, it's not an official Reggie's Corner today. That, that'll return. We, I haven't had time to go through a, a very many emails at all. But th this was a unique one that, uh, that was sent directly to me by some, I assume, means of hacking or, or to make sure I saw it. But it, it attracted me because of not only the subject, but also because Robert is writing from Hohenwald, Tennessee. H-O-H-E-N-W-A-L-D. And when we used to run that as a spot show, we called it Hole in the Wall, Tennessee, on the promos and when we were sitting in the disgusting fucking building. So Robert from Hole in the Wall, Tennessee, this, he would like to make a submission for Reggie's Corner. On my property in downtown Hohenwald, Tennessee, I have four dogs, one cat, and 30 chickens. As you can see, I'm a friend of all the furry woodland creatures. We started our chicken journey with just six chickens. Since then, we have obviously grown as they seem to be like an addiction, and you just have to collect all the different types of them. One of our original six chickens passed away a few weeks back. Her name was Angelina Jolie. Parenthetically, I named her a name in which I obviously cursed her with. In her lifetime, she survived three dog attacks and one hawk attack that also killed our rooster, Hey Hey. A few weeks ago... What is this? Well, it's an email from one of the listeners, Robert from Hohenwald. A few weeks ago, Angelina Jolie got very sick, and we feared she had become egg-bound. For those that do not know, that means the egg is stuck inside of her. <laughs> and if she is unable to pass it, she is going to die. Unfortunately, we do not have any vets in our area that handle chickens. We did our best to help her pass the egg, but she succumbed the next day. She has been laid to rest next to our rooster, and there is a small hole in our flock. She was an older gal for a chicken. But for some reason, what was supposed to be a livestock animal ended up being a pet. She loved to get up in your lap and be petted, and her favorite treat was Frito's corn chips. P.S. We had the egg for breakfast. Hey, come on! For heaven's sake, at least let him have time to grieve. Poor Angelina Jolie. How's uh, Hee Haw? Whatever. What was the name of uh... Haw Haw? Haw Haw! How... <laughs> No, hey, hey, is what it was. It was hey, hey. Not haw haw. Don't misidentify that rooster. Oh, where was this guy from? Hohenwald, Tennessee. That's right, that's right. But anyway, we're sorry. And I'd wondered why I hadn't seen Angelina Jolie around lately in public. She became egg bound. Terrible when that happens. Have you ever been egg bound, Brian? Oh, you sound like Terry Funk asking that question. <laughs> <For some reason. laughs> Have you been egg bound? You egg sucking dog. <laughs> well, let me tell you, and by the speaking of, I guess this is a perfect transition. Speaking of eggs and birthing things, I misspoke on the drive through this past weekend. I mentioned that I had talked to Bobby Eaton's daughter, Taryn. And she told me, I said that she said Dustin, Bobby's son, had just had twins. Come to find, talk to Dustin, come to find he's having them. He, it's in the process. He's not actually doing it himself. He's, he's had somebody else contracted out for the, the actual act of that. 
but they're going to be his too. And they're coming Christmas time, a, a Christmas present there. So I apologize for bringing his children into the world three months early, but it's perfect timing because the reason why we've all been talking about that lately is because of the Midnight Express action figure set for our 40th anniversary and last will be the first and last and only time ever an official action figure set of all four of us, Bobby, Stan, Dennis, and myself, exclusive to Cornette's Collectibles and JimCornette.com in conjunction with Figures Toys, and we've announced it over the past. I think just the YouTube videos of us announcing and talking about these things have hit six figures in views, I believe, and we've had a lot of interest, and we want to remind everybody that the pre-orders begin Saturday, September 2nd at noon Eastern time at jimcornette.com. The feather bottoms have outdone themselves. If you go right now to the website, click on the banner on the home page, you can see pictures of everything, all the written information, the different type of packages that's available. But basically, with the basic package, which is just swell, you get the four-pack of action figures in the display box, heavily illustrated with a 28-page full-color book of milestones, great moments, matches, crowds, gates, contract disputes of our careers, uh, also a certificate of authenticity that this is genuine and one of a limited edition of 2,000 that will not be offered for sale again, and an autographed reunion picture of the four of us most packages with autographs by Dennis Stan, and I will be personalizing everything, but we do have 100 pictures that Bobby signed back in 2019, and we're making that available as a separate package so you can get all four of our autographs. And there's nine packages with the last available Midnight Express scrapbook signed by all four of us that I can find on this earth that people will part with. And you're going to pay through the nose for them, but I don't care if anybody buys those or not because that thing only gets more valuable. Uh, but it all starts Saturday, September 2nd. And you can order my merchandise at any time, but if you pre-order the midnight set, you can only order that because we're not going to be shipping them out right away. We're going to be taking September to personalize all of the pictures from the pre-orders, pack all the boxes and we will be shipping by the first week of October when everything goes on general sale for Christmas if there are any left we don't know what's going to happen here so I would advise everybody if your heart's set on this jump in on September the 2nd or immediately there afterwards uh, but again you know I've taught all of the midnights are appreciative to everybody for just the the interest so far and the feedback and everybody talking about them and a lot of the collectors having said, oh, we've been waiting for this because, as I mentioned, we're splitting the proceeds equally and Bobby's part will go to his kids and grandkids, which is why we've been talking in, and in contact um, with his upcoming grandkids. We mentioned that he'll at this Christmas he'll have seven, Bobby will, grandkids. He only saw four of them. But this is these kids' chance to have not only the action figures to remember their grandfather that they never met, but also it's a nest egg for them at the same time with the last thing that, that he did. So anyway, and as I said, the feather bottoms have outdone themselves on the layout if you want to go look at this stuff now. But remember the date, Saturday, September 2nd at noon. And uh, this will be the big one for our 40th anniversary. And if that's Brian, too rich for your what? blood, remember Arcadia and Vanguard this year, we're celebrating the 39th anniversary of the Stop and Go Express. We have all new booklets and uh, little <laughs> clay figures that uh, my kids are making in the basement. The Stop wait and Go Express, no royalty fees, nothing. I'm keeping everything. Wait, do you mean none of this is going to Tommy Hagee? Who? Hey, I can't remember what it was Tommy Hagee and somebody that used to work for Nick that Bobby was we were laughing in the car one day because we you know he knew him but he said he nicknamed him the stop and go express what the fuck is that but that there's a if there, if there was an SO station down the street it would have been a different team there's a convenience store chain 
in the Southwest. They're in Oklahoma. They may be in Texas. I think they're in Missouri. I've got the T-shirt, so this is actual fact. Come and go. K-U-M and go. And <sighs> that's unfortunate. It's just, it, but it's <laughs> it, maybe it's a selling point. Maybe it's an attraction for you know. I just I I like their their snacks. Their their food was good. Their sandwiches and stuff like that. But the store so know. good. Yeah, the store so good. You don't want to say their name in front of your children. Well, that's true. But just every time I'd go to the bathroom, I'd have to take a big roll of toilet paper and stuff it in this hole in the wall. So people <laughs> would be peeking at me as I was stop. And I'll, t I'll tell you something else. The guy next to me kept kept kicking me, kicking my foot. Fuck! I was my toes were black and blue by the time I got out of there. Where was this bathroom? It was at the come and go. But anyway, speaking of coming and going. <laughs> no, I'm serious. What the hell are you transitioning to I'm, now? I'm speaking <laughs> well of coming and going, some people come into your life and some people go out of your life. And there's been a weasel lately that's gone out of our life named Colin Thompson that we've been talking about. And usually you're about halfway up his ass with some fucking barbed wire fucking with him but i just i've unfortunately, actually had, unfortunately at this point we're standing in line uh well yeah yeah it's it's and the 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 billy club and the brass knucks and the slap jack and the coat hanger and a lot of people but i've had a few of the cult members contact me and just make comments they don't know for sure people's business but we were you know when we were talking about colin thompson by the way who is the Weasel, the CEO of Cast Media, now the only employee of Cast Media since his employees are in a class action suit against him and the rest of them have resigned and threatened to sue him to get out of their contract so that they can actually be free to make a living. He's the only one at Cast Media, but he's the one that's trying to do the stock scam, perpetrating fraud with old Rob Ellen, the weasel who's the CEO of Live One slash Podcast One that we've been talking about on the programs here recently. He's a mook. The mook. But, you know, we've said that we're not the only ones affected. There's the, the mom and pop podcasters that, you know, were setting themselves up to try to have a little income so they could take care of sick family members or you know, during the pandemic, for whatever reason, they needed to change occupations or, you know, some small folks that can't bear these losses. But there's big names that are apparently tied up in this also. Now, we we don't know their business, but we can assume and presume based on things that we do know. Sarah Silverman, she's a fine young comedian. And she's a name that a lot of people might recognize. She had a podcast tied up in some form or fashion with cast media. And Brian, would you know the the fans have told me that she hasn't had a new podcast out in about two months now. That seems awful because it was fairly regular right before that every week or so. And then bam, nothing. If a big name celebrity like Sarah Silverman can be derailed and inconvenienced by this weasel and his mook friend. Well, that's, you know, if, if, of course, now, if Sarah wants to come on the program and tell us that there maybe she's just been taking a vacation, but, you know, we don't know this to be true, but a lot of people say in it that there's problems with cast media. And, you know, Penn Gillette, Brian, you know him. Penn yeah. and Teller, the magicians, right? I've always really liked them, yeah. I always said Teller is the one that don't talk. That's always been a tickle of mine. But old Penn Gillette, he lost a lot of weight. He used to be a bigger fella. He That's used right. to be a big motherfucker, as Rick Ross would say. And now he's in good shape, and he's always uh, done interesting things, and he's had a weird record label, so an interesting guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, he used to have a podcast tied up in some way with cast media, but apparently now his fans are telling me he's just on Patreon, doing his own thing. Apparently his podcast has been derailed. Maybe it's one of those deals where Colin or cast media owned his feed and he couldn't get away from him or he maybe he couldn't afford to do the show anymore because he wasn't getting paid for all the advertising he had done. He's just gone over to Patreon, just run, run off the podcasting planet. 
Now, we don't know this to be a fact, but it sure is odd that all these people, that whether they be small, independent operators or whether they be names that you would know, all of a sudden, everybody was tied up with cast media, <laughs> off the air, off the airwaves, except for us, and except for the fact that we're saying this, not a lot of other people are able to do this. They're apparently, their hands are legally tied. But it's a shame that uh, all these shows that have all these listeners and all these fans, they can't get serviced anymore because of this weasel and this fraud that he's trying to perpetrate, whatever it may be, allegedly, with Live One and this IPO, what is it, initial public offering? That's right. See there, I know all these terms. Very good. Stock in a, if not worthless, highly suspect company. And I just wanted to, again, remind everybody, this is not just about wrestling, it's not just about podcasting, it's about people in front of our faces trying to get away with something. And Colin and Rob, I say again, we have been saying this in front of hundreds of thousands, by now millions of people, out loud. You can check the views on the YouTube channel if you can't get statistics on podcasts. Well, you, you guys may know somebody, so you know how many people's hearing this. But where, what have we heard from Colin? We haven't heard anything from Colin. He's underground. He's not a weasel. He's a mole. He dug down deep because a lot of people are looking for him. You better stay there. But Rob, Rob is out, as we illustrated on the drive through here a few days ago. He's out doing interviews, extolling the virtues of this big podcast network company they're going to put together, and they're going to sell stock in this, and they're going to give stock to the people that's on it. In exchange, he doesn't add for the money they're already owed for work they've already done. That was stolen through fraud. That was stolen through fraud, malfeasance, misappropriation. Financial fraud. We're, we're willing to use any of those terms. But anyway, that's what he's doing is he's out doing interviews and ignoring what we're saying because he doesn't want to call attention to it because the podcasting world might know about it and the wrestling world, thanks to us, might know about it. But so far, apparently, the Securities and Exchange Commission has not investigated it well, or at all, as far as we know, and that's what we're just trying to do. We're trying to call some attention to things to make sure that everything is disinfected with the sunlight, and if they can prove that their deal is on the up and up, then more power to them, but also Rob and Colin and any of your other peripheral stooges such as what's his name Sackbag, the lawyer neil Sack. sacker neil sacker. sacker what we're saying is out in public here and if it's demonstrably untrue if it's provably false if you claim that we do not have documentation to back up what we have said and or if you would like to question anything that we have said without documentation that can go into the discovery process and civil litigation if you're feeling froggy, fucker, hop. Otherwise, we're going to keep talking about you. Even if our listeners have to skip ahead, we're doing it for our own goddamn amusement and also because we're going to do everything we can to make sure that your deal that's supposed to go through next month gets looked at upside, downways, and crossways by people who might know what the fuck's going on. Because you're trying to pull something. That's what I'm saying. Shut me up or prove me wrong, motherfucker. I'm sorry, motherfuckers. They're trying to treat podcasters like, like a scummy record label in the 50s would treat a musician. Hey, if you want to buy Podcast One stock or Live One stock or whatever this company is going to be called stock, if they'll steal from us, they'll steal from you. Listen, if a company has a history of owing everyone money and their solution is to spin off part of their company to create another stock, how many times is that going to happen? How many times will that happen? And let's also talk about one of the key things. Beyond the financial fraud, which may really be the undoing of Colin Thompson, beyond 
trying to repay us for the fraud, and also force us into a deal with a company no one wants to deal with. Beyond all of that, the person who caused all the problems, the person who misappropriated all the funds, the person who was controlling the accounting, he's the one who's going to end up with a job. Not all the people, the press release, go back to the initial press release about the sale of certain assets, go back to looking forward to working with the cast team now joining uh, Live One and it's going to be great. Uh, the cast team all joined the unemployment line. Same thing in the emails we got. It'll be seamless. You'll keep working with your cast team, but, but start talking to these guys right now. They blew out the team. He screwed over his shows. He screwed over his investors. He screwed over his employees. And he's the one that Rob Ellen thinks is worth protecting. He's the one, for some weird reason, that Rob Ellen thinks is worth wrapping his arm around. Any other show has a problem getting out of their, uh, getting their RSS feed, let us know. Maybe we have some advice for you. Yeah, and, and by the way, the deals that uh, Rob Ellen is saying are never going to happen again and you can't possibly get took us seven days to get. Very important note there, though. They're impossible to get if you work with a big bullshit company with a high overhead, like a Podcast One. But that's not what podcasting is supposed to be about. Podcasting is supposed to be about independence. Who says, you know what would really make things better? For some people to come in and treat this like, like I said before, scummy record label owners in the 50s. I'm going to get your publishing. I'm going to own the rights to everything. It's all, I'm going to control the money. You'll get it when I tell you you can. Even though you're supposed to get it every month, you'll get it when I tell you you can. That's what this shit is. But that's not what podcasting is supposed to be. These guys are trying to do, in a haphazard way, with less talented people involved, what Vince McMahon tried to do to wrestling in 1984. But it's a different world and it's a different platform. And it only works if people get roped into it like this. You only get your money if you sign a deal with Podcast One. That's the only offer you're getting. You want this money, you have to. It's easy for us to say, fuck you. To be quite honest, Jim and I are financially secure. It's easy for us to say, into the six figures that you owe us, fuck you. Fuck you, you're not going to hold this hostage. It's not so easy for other people. Whether that money is $20,000, whether that money's $100,000, I saw another show, I won't say their name, it's up to them, because they didn't name cast, but another show came out saying they're owed $100,000 from their advertising agency. And let's say, if I don't think Sarah Silverman is on a soup line, but another byproduct of this, not only people that can't afford it, is people that can't get out of it. He's got her feed, maybe. Or he's got her goddamn production team that he just pulled away and then they all dispersed when the company immolated or they don't realize that his contracts are bullshit and and are easily <laughs> we're violated a long time violated. ago yeah, yeah we're violated a long time ago and it's one other show and i won't say their name because they haven't publicly said anything but a lot of internet sleuths and listeners of their programs have said stuff about a show a series of shows owed 1.4 million dollars from their advertising agency. Turns out it was Cast Media. The word is that that person signed a deal with Podcast One. If you're owed 1.4, well, it's a little less than 500 grand that you're going to get up front if you got the same deal offer that we got. I don't know if he did, because quite frankly, we seem to be getting better deals than everyone else does. But that's almost 500 grand with the promise of another almost 500 grand in stock and payment over two years in undefined monetary terms. I wouldn't do that. Again, I don't want to be held hostage, but that's the problem. You could understand why a show like that, rather not say anything, rather not fight the system, rather just get some of their money and then have to deal with the new overlord and hope that somehow it works out better. But it'll just work out the same. That's the problem. Well, and one more interesting point, and we'll move on. You mentioned that show has moved over to Podcast One. How many shows affiliated with Cast Media have we seen or can we verify or have been announced as moving from Cast Media 
to podcast one. I believe they've only announced two shows, but it's actually like one show and there's a spinoff show. Some more news <laughs> and more news, I think it is, or some news. It's Some news, more news. There's something going on. They there's took some the, news again. They took the deal, apparently. Yeah, so there hasn't been a, a mass exodus of, oh God, let us in. They're not beating the doors down. No, I mean, as we are recording right now, from what we have been told, Colin is right now in arbitration. He's also right now being sued already. And that's not even counting the class action lawsuit against him and Cast Media from former employees. And there's more to come. And Rob Ellen's still wrapping his arms around this guy. What the fuck is going on? And by the way, just give us our fucking money, <laughs> you fucking dopes. Or at least give us the accounting so we can really get mad. So, yes, yeah, so we know exactly <laughs> how much it was you stole from us. We're only estimating so far because we don't trust your figures. Yeah. You know why they're not saying shit? Because the last thing they want to do is sue, and the last thing they want us to do is go to Discovery, because we know exactly what to look for and where to look for it. And who to talk to about it. Bingo. But after, what, four weeks from now, let's close with this. After four weeks from now, it won't matter because they'll have issued this stock, right? That's what they're trying to do under the radar without nothing to see here. Look at the pretty monkey on the wall, whatever. They're just trying to get through with that. And again, he knows what's going on, Rob Ellen. Colin knows what's going on. They've heard what's happening here. They've been asked by reporters, from what I understand, about the accusations we've made here, accusations we could back up with documentation, ac accusations we could back up with emails and text messages from Colin himself. So they haven't said boo about any of this, but they're aware of it. The last thing they want is any attention on it because they know what we're saying is fucking true. Everything we have said about this is true. And there's a lot of people they're fucking with. And this isn't going to end. People don't like do this and like, all right, you know what? I fucked with a bunch of people's lives. Now I'm going to be a decent person. <laughs> now it's time to give back to my community for real and care. No. No, it's going to be who do I fuck over next? No, no, no. I'll have you know that I've already seen the press release. Colin Thompson is, is currently opening a halfway house for girls who won't go all the way. Well, we'll see about that. By the way, if you're hearing this on the air, reminder, this has been legally cleared by Stephen P. New. If you have a problem with anything we said in this, have your lawyer call Stephen P. New. 888-692-8084. Well, there's another fella that might be calling Stephen any time now. I don't know... Uh, if he needs Stephen P. News number 888-692-8084, but our boy Cash Wheeler made some news this past week. Have we heard his story, or have we just heard the other guy's story so far? First of all, he's uh, not our boy. He's your boy, maybe. Oh, come on! Well, yeah, I did hear his story. I, I will talk about what the uh, police have said or what the accusation is. His story is that the gun was planted by the Bang Bang Gang. Oh, come on now. Bullet Club Gold, bang, bang! No, hey, now just because... And the guns! Just because there's every reason to believe that the Freebirds planted those drugs on Kerry when he came through the DFW airport doesn't mean that history is going to repeat itself. And people think we're kidding. No, that ha 83, that happened. Fans were actually calling the police, saying that Freebirds planted it. They found Kerry and his girlfriend at the time, I don't know if they were married, coming across the border from Mexico with like every color pill you could ever imagine <laughs> and all sorts of powders. And it didn't become a big issue because of the power of Fritz, but also when the little bits of it got into the newspaper, that's when people started calling the police station saying that if anyone would have these kind of pills, it's Michael Hayes. <laughs> yes, Michael Hayes. It must have been Michael Hayes. He's a goddamn pharmacy. Hey, I'll, here, this is totally not the subject, but you know about Buddy Roberts in the boot, right? You know, know that story. I don't know. The fucking Freebird, it's Reunion Arena, one of the Star Wars events that they ran like four times a year in the big Von Erichs Freebird feud of 83. And this was whatever is happening in the match. Buddy Roberts has hit the ring to help the Freebirds beat down the Von Erichs and Buddy <laughs> takes his goddamn cowboy boot Oh, I do know this. To, <laughs> to hit one of the Von Erics over the head with it when he raises it up, an ounce of fucking weed falls out in the middle of the ring. <laughs> <laughs> and he just snatches up, puts it in his pocket, and keeps hitting the guy with the fucking cowboy boot. Anyway, okay, well then maybe you can 
enlighten me some, because here's what I heard. I We heard on the internet all of a sudden, just a day or so ago, that Cash Wheeler got arrested in Florida for aggravated assault with a weapon or with a deadly weapon. I don't know exactly what the phrase is of the charge, but aggravated assault with a weapon of some description. And what the fuck, right? And then come to find out, I guess the complaint was filed back a couple of weeks ago, and he turned himself in along with, I guess, his attorney here a day or two ago, and then was arraigned, I believe is the phraseology, and they put him out on $2,500 bail and told him not to have any contact with whoever this other guy is. Obviously, it wasn't a domestic situation. It was now being called a road rage deal. And the story that, if you know Cash's side, let me tell the, the other guy's story as I understand it from reading the complaint that was on the internet, that this guy, whatever his name is, driving down the road and sees in his rearview mirror a car... I don't know what the terminology was, darting or dodging in and out of traffic, coming up quick. And this guy gets over to let the, the car go by, but that car goes to the right of him on the shoulder, pulls up next to him. A guy with a beard points a handgun at him and then drives on. <laughs> Oh, so it's not funny, but just well, it's you know. not funny. But no, that's what the guy said. That was his story. He didn't know who this fun guy was. A guy with a beard, white guy with a beard, points a gun at him, and then drives on down the road. But now they're committed, I guess, to going off on the exit. So he takes a picture of the license plate, and then I guess contacts the authorities and. They end up, it's Cash's license plate, I guess, and or the guy identified his picture when they got the picture that goes to the license plate or whatever. Yeah, they said he identified the picture, I believe. Okay. And so Cash hears about it, turns himself in and pleads not guilty. And I saw the they had two minutes of the arraignment clipped on Twitter, and I saw his attorney is saying, okay, here's a 36-year-old man with no criminal record. And he's pleading not guilty. And uh, we asked for $2,500 bail, and they granted that. And off he goes, and he's paid the bail, and he's been released and free to pursue a life of religious freedom and make the Wembley Stadium show. Because it, I guess that, that's aggravated assault with a deadly weapon by the, by the definition of the law in the legal books, but I don't necessarily think that that's, when you think of aggravated assault with a weapon, you're thinking he beat him over the head with a fucking bat or whatever. Yeah, when I first saw the charges, I thought like, oh, okay, they pulled over on the road, he got out of the car, and I pulled the gun on him. Not like he drove by waving the gun at him. Well, but, Which okay. is still not okay, but... I didn't here's, here's what I was going to say, and maybe your, uh, what you have to add to this will help me out with my problems understanding. I'm not, I don't know what this guy, I, I do know that I've been on both sides of police witness statements for and again, and I've also been on both sides of, of statements made in civil litigation, and Brian, you would be surprised, you'd be surprised how many times that the two sides do not in any way <laughs> coalesce or match with each other. Completely opposite stories. But the guy's story was that I have the problem is Cash Wheeler is a 36-year-old guy with no criminal record, and he's a TV, if not star, he's on television. He's a recognizable person, especially in the state of Florida. If this guy sees him in the rearview mirror, dodging or swerving or merging in and out of traffic and coming up fast trying to get home well and he gets sorry because i'm driven like a maniac on the road sometimes that's what you do you drive i'm just i'm i shouldn't well no i i don't and i was gonna say i don't do you do that really 
Just because you're trying to get fucking home, you're swerving in and out of fucking traffic? I wouldn't say, uh, when you say traffic, I mean, no one's like standing still, but if it's like moving, but no one's really going at a faster pace and you see a route where you can go like in and out a few times and the road will open up, hey, absolutely, I'm not waving a gun around. And The verbal picture that this guy's painting is it's, it's fucking goddamn the movie duel and there's poor dennis fucking weaver sweating because this goddamn 18 wheelers bearing down on him he's he sees enough to get out of the way for this guy move over so this guy can come past and then cash goes to the right of him on the shoulder if he's just moved out of the way why would there be a need for that because he just moved out of the way and then if Cash pointed the gun at him for the crime of moving over and getting out of the way, then has Cash just been pointing a gun at everybody that he was passing? He's like, get out of my fucking way. I'm going home like Brian Last. <laughs> what? Not like Brian Last. I usually don't wave my gun around. I don't have a gun in the car. No, I'm telling you. And there's you, no guns being waved around. He was around. driving home like you, being a menace to society behind the wheel, but he didn't have a gun. Leaving everyone alone and driving efficiently yet fast. All right. Line. And and taking every opportunity you can to take any open space and run with it. But the point is, was Cash waving a gun at everybody? If Cash was coming up fast and this guy got over, and then Cash got to the right of him and pointed the gun at him, was he the guy that maybe Cash was chasing? Was there more to the story? Or is this all bullshit? And did he point at him with a fucking finger wag and give him a stern talking to and the guy didn't fucking like it? There's the big thing, and there's why Cash will skate on this. I'm Cash Wheeler. Ask me about what I did with the gun. What did you do with the gun, Cash? What gun? Good idea. Because who saw him else saw him with a gun? I'm saying I didn't have a gun. This one guy saying he saw me with a gun, but he took a picture of my plate, not me waving my gun around in the air. What gun? Sorry. Sorry to be uh, on the defense here. <laughs> well, but, but besides that, <laughs> what, then, what precipitated this? We're expected to believe that Cash Wheeler, because a guy moved over a lane to get out of his way, decided to fucking bop around the guy on the shoulder and point a gun at him? What happened first? Do you have it? What is Cash's uh, reflection on this, if, if, if any, that you know? That I know Cash's reflection is, I'm not going to say anything, and my lawyer's going to do the talking until this is over. Well, that's good. That's smart. Has the lawyer said anything yet? Just what we saw at the uh, arraignment. Okay, so what I'm saying is... All arraignment wrestling... <laughs> All arraignment wrestling. <laughs> I'm not saying if Cash did point to fucking semi-automatic <laughs> fucking gun at somebody for moving over a lane, then that that's probably conduct that won't fly in this fucking current environment in society, and I would not be able to agree with it either. But I got to hear more details. And by the and way, I, it is important to note that as of, uh, from what I'm seeing here, as of July 1st, Florida is, they allow concealed carry. Well, yeah, here's another thing. They called a guy and said, come down to the court and turn yourself in because some guy says you pointed a gun at him when they just made it legal for people to walk around with guns hidden on their fucking person. So you don't think this is going to start happening more often? Right. I mean, that's really the big story of this whole thing with Cash Wheeler. Florida sucks. Why does anyone <laughs> live there anymore? Well, I thought he lived in North Carolina. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I believe, right next to Tampa. What? No, God. All right, I'm confused on his geography, but it, here's the point. <laughs> I need to hear more details because that story does not add up. And I've been involved in situations not with, this was road rage of anonymous people. And I've told you some stories, Brian, and we've told some on a podcast of being in car chases and car situations with angry fans going after the heels in the territory days, which is obviously not this incident, you know, where somebody was actively threatening somebody else, chasing somebody else because of who they specifically were, you know, I, I don't think 
the heels have to carry guns anymore because of who they are in wrestling. But, you know, it seems like since everybody's got a fucking gun, more of this shit's going to happen, and then whoever gets mad, mad about it the most is going to call the cops on the other guy. So let's see what the fuck happened from all standpoints before we decide. Remember the the guy that claimed in in the newspaper and in the police statement that I walked over to the rail and began clubbing him about the fucking head for no apparent reason when our story was, well, after he hopped the rail and tackled Bobby Eaton, I came around the corner and whacked him on top of the head. Those were two completely different things. I'm telling you, I'm going with what gun? What gun? What did the gun look like? I'm just, I, again, I'm saying it doesn't make sense as the story is told. If Cash was some drunk, fucking, pilled up, goddamn miscellaneous average human, maybe, but why would a guy that's on television, that is recognizable, that has no criminal record, be driving down the street, fucking pointing guns at people at random that have not been involved with him before, even seconds before, minutes before, in some other fashion, I will leave the door open that the driver and the complainant may have potentially done something to instigate some behavior that he then maybe wasn't fond of afterwards. But The, the driver had a skullet and was listening to Kansas. There you go. It, he he's the lost buckaroo, but no, I, I I need more information. I need to hear much more about this before. And apparently the court does too, because if they let you out on $2,500 bail and say, yeah, go wherever you want to do whatever you want. And you turn yourself in anyway. What kind of menace to society do they think you are? Now he's going to skate. What gun? That's it. That's all he has to do. What gun? If there's no photo of him waving this gun around, this guy had enough time to take a photo of the license plate, but nothing else. What gun? Let me ask you this. Everyone has presumed that likely at Wembley, FTR will be losing the titles and losing the third match to the Young Bucks. Now with Cash Wheeler's arrest, everyone's really thinking it. The fact that this is now public, does that change what you do? And secondly, to the AEW story, if Tony knew about this, does it... I guess the question is, when did Cash let AEW know? Was it when this all broke, which I think is probably unlikely, or was it when it first happened and the warrant was issued? But in terms of AEW's response to it, what do you think? Well, it, I was against the idea of FTR losing this match at Wembley anyway. I think they should have should win the two out of three. But now, since pretty much everybody thinks that's the, the nail in the coffin, that's when I would switch it up if, well, two things. And number one's insurmountable. If Cash was up front with this and has no heat with Tony and told him it was going on, and it doesn't prevent him from making any appearances and harm business in that respect, and if Tony, obviously, I would think, is a guy that would know what Cash's side was, and if he's still got Tony's confidence because of what that story is, then I definitely would put FTR over because it would shock people even more. But the insurmountable problem with that is the Bucks are, it's, they still, they're not going to want to lose the match at the biggest show of all time. And they're flying their whole family over, I'm sure. And they're going to have box seats and they're going to have streamers and cake and punch and pie. And noisemakers and pat each other on the dicks and talk about how great they are. And what's good for business or better for the overall company or story or whatever the case is going to come secondary to that. So prove me wrong, Bucks. Put the guys over. They're better than you and you know it. Hey, one other question. Other than the fact this is an ongoing legal matter, concerning talent that thus far has not been suspended. There's been no public reprimand. He's going to be booked as he was going to be. So far, that's what it looks like. But wrestling booked, you mean? Now, now yeah. there's two kinds of booking going well, that's on true. here. That's true. Do you think AEW should have done something different on Collision last night as we are recording? Where 
They had to, you know, they announced he was going to, FTR was going to say something, and that was a real false advertising moment right there. Because even though they did, it was in a package and it had nothing to do with this. I was about to say, I would have sworn FTR, I've skipped through so many of those quick 10 second comments in those fucking packages. I didn't even see them. Should they have started the show or should they at least have addressed this issue on the show? Do you think people were tuning in thinking they would? It's an ongoing legal situation. And because it's not something that can ever even be used in storyline or should be, I think they probably should have done something. Even if Cash did a, just a promo in the back, for those of you who know, you know, hey, there's two sides to every story, and one I've got's going to be coming out sooner or later, but I promise you this, there's nothing going to stop me from being in London at Wembley Stadium next weekend or whenever the fuck, and that's a fact. And then just have the announcers reiterate, FTR will be blah, blah, blah against the Buckaroos. And just make sure that they know, the fans, that they're going to see the match. I That was very quick to comment on something that is would be fairly trivial if he weren't a public figure, and it's not something that they can use to draw any money with going forward. The whole idea is, is he going to be there or not? not give the whole goddamn story right now, I think. Well, we shall see what happens with Cash Wheeler, and uh, we'll see who else gets arrested in the weeks ahead. In AEW. Why are you transitioning out of a topic like it's your show when it's my show? It's your show. Boy, well, they goddamn can't, boy, they can't get out of their own way, AEW. It's like, the only reason we weren't talking about punk fighting with everyone <laughs> is because Cash got arrested, <laughs> and punk fighting with everyone stopped us from talking about the women's locker room issues which stopped us from the thing before that, it's like nonstop. When you watch, and we'll talk about it later, when you watch that Cody documentary, you understand why he's so calm now in those yes. interview settings. Goose Fraba. <laughs> he's, he's like a Zen master now that he's, he's back in, you know, he thrives in a corporate environment because he likes to wear a suit and shit. And we'll talk about the Cody documentary here in a few minutes, but he likes to wear the suit. He likes to interact with people. You could see him, do a production production chores and things at AEW, and these other guys are in their fucking sloppy clothes and their fucking skateboards, and they don't give two shits. And it just, it, it, yeah, there's a big difference. Well, I'll tell you what Cash should have done there in that incident. Brian, he would have got out of this scot-free. We wouldn't have heard a thing about it. Nothing would have happened. You want to know how? How's that? Well, I'll tell you, Wilbur. It's quite simple because the description of him was a white guy with a beard. All he had to do was go home and shave that son of a gun off. And if he had that slick baby face that's underneath that, well, nobody would have ever recognized. He could have said some some terrorist had had absconded with his vehicle. And he terrorist. doesn't know where it's at. A terrorist. Well, you know, they got those long beards all the way down to their crotches. Folks, don't look like a terrorist and don't get arrested for road rage shave your face and the rest of you for that matter with our friends from manscapes platinum package because they're going to make your package look like it's made out of platinum you know we haven't had manscaped on in a while there was a slight interruption but we want to remind you that they've got the world's finest toys to treat your beautiful boys and Nothing is better than the Platinum Package 4.0. What are you snickering at over there? Nothing like a bad rhyme to make me laugh. Everybody knows you need to take care of your bouncing bundle of joy. Um, and the Platinum Package 4.0 from Manscaped.com is the one-stop shop for the man who has a lot of problems on his, on his body in various places. It's going to get rid of all the disgustingness on you. You're going to get the Lawnmower 4.0 Trimmer, which is the best body shaver that's ever been created by modern medicine and scientific technology. You're going to get the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer to get all those shaggy bushes out of your various other head holes. You're going to get Ultra Premium Body Wash and 2-in-1 Shampoo and Conditioner and Deodorant to keep yourself from smelling like a man eating from under cheese in a septic tank of a slaughterhouse. And... They've even got crop preserver stuff to make sure your balls don't chafe. I mean, they've got it all, all 
just tricked out here. Proprietary advanced <laughs> skin safe technology. They've got it to all. Protect all your delicate parts and holes, you know, the saggy and the wrinkly stuff. You're not going to slice yourself from asshole to appetite with these things, folks. And you can upgrade your shower routine with the ultra premium body wash and ultra premium two in one shampoo and conditioner where you will smell like a floozy from a New Orleans whorehouse. And don't forget to apply their <laughs> aluminum-free ultra-premium deodorant for that cologne-quality scent on the go. Cologne-quality, folks. It don't get no better than that for, a, for a scent. When it's up there, that's all the way up into the, the fucking orange level of warning. They can, they can smell you coming a mile away. They're going to cover all your bases from head to toe and hair to balls and... All that stuff right now, while they're still friendly with us, folks, go to manscaped.com. Our old friends, we've always thought so much of them and remember them at Christmas. Don't take this personally. Manscaped.com, you can get 20% off and free shipping with the code DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E. That's because that's your program, Brian. 20% off and free shipping with the code DRIVE at manscaped.com. And you will, you'll save money and you'll smell better and you'll be slicker. And you know what? You don't, you don't want a liquor unless she's slicker. I think what we mean to say is welcome back, Manscaped. We love you. And we're happy to have you back. And everyone should support our sponsors because they support us. A lot of these things will work on females too. Well, yeah, not gender exclusive or anything. That will at Manscaped. I don't want to scare the the fairer sex of in our audience off you can you can get rid of a lot of hair and you might smell like a guy yeah, but you know you'll get rid no. of a lot of hair with some of this stuff you just have to think about the hair removal not the scent there's no scent that's given off by the shaving no not the shaving but uh, you might not want to you might not want to have a cologne quality scent if you're a woman if you're a woman but it's aluminum free so you got that going for you you want to get ladyscaped have you ever wrapped yourself up in aluminum, Brian? No. You ever been in a Turkish prison? Oh boy, here we go. I'll tell you what, I felt like I was in a Turkish prison in August of 1983. Would you like to know why? <laughs> the transitions are flying high this week, ladies and gentlemen, here on The Experience. Yes, they certainly are. But uh, here, was it just, when was it? Was it last week on this program or just on the drive through here recently? It was on the drive through It was on the drive through We did a month in my life where we had talked about the day on Adrian Street's passing when I used to manage him and my days doing that and picked a specific month and gave some uh, background on the Memphis Territory and what the schedule was like and talking about how you know, people could see live wrestling constantly in those days in every part of the country on a regular basis and how busy even the Tennessee Territory was. In January of 1983, I worked 28 days, had three days off, but I did four double shots, so I worked more times than there were day and managed multiple times per night. I worked more days than there were in the month, and made about 2600 and something dollars which translates to almost 8 grand in today's money. I said, "Boy, that that wasn't bad for a learning experience, right? And I'm involved with Bill Dundee and and the angle with him and you know, really getting experience and learning what the fuck to do as a manager." But then somebody on Twitter said, "Well, you should do you know, like 40 years ago or whatever. And I looked back because August 1983 was a different story for me <laughs> than, than was January. In January, I was farting through silk, as Nick Goulis would say. And in August of 1983, I was eating the hamburger helper with no hamburger. Because it wasn't my entire rookie year was not a raving success. And... I thought since it is the month of August 2023, we would look back briefly at uh, August 1983 and see how fucked I was a couple months before Bill Watts came up to visit. Would you like to hop into this, Brian? Yeah, and by the way, Bill Watts' territory is getting pretty fucked up by this point, which is why he came to visit. 
Yes, and see, I've now the the Tennessee territory was doing fine overall. I was just not. Um, and, and we should mention it. That, where's the story of the split between Lawler and Jarrett? Not the split, but the the beef and between Lawler and Jarrett in the spring of '83 and that whole thing on our YouTube collections. We've told that. We've told it, but in different things, I guess. What everyone can agree on is that when Jerry Lawler saw or heard about Jerry Jarrett's new house, (laughs) and there was the big grand opening, and Lance Russell may have had very similar thoughts at the same time, Yeah, that they thought maybe they weren't getting their equal share, and they would do things on their own, and talent were called, talent were booked, on top of the talent that were already there and that were already booked, and the split didn't happen, but some people had to go away. Well, and and um, going back to Jarrett's housewarming, which was, oh God, July of 82. As I mentioned here not long ago, I was there in my powder blue tuxedo that I'd rented to take pictures of the occasion. Bill Dundee was there because he was, at the time, good friends with Jerry and and lived right down the road. Stan Lane and Steve Kern were there because the Fabs were Jarrett's brand new project, the greatest tag team he'd put together in 20 years. Jerry Lawler wasn't there. He lived in Memphis. You know, you might not want to drive 200 miles each way for somebody's housewarming. That's what I thought at the time. (laughs) Apparently, there were other issues. But it's funny how Jarrett's housewarming led to two momentous occasions because as we talked about it, when we look back on it, it wasn't three weeks later he called me in the office at Channel 5 and said, hey, did you ever think about being a manager? And meanwhile, because I got so much heat with my tuxedo, I guess, and meanwhile, Lawler started stewing because in 1977, the reason why Jarrett was instantly successful in splitting off from Nick Goulas and running Memphis was because Lawler and Lance went with him. And he had said at the time, they said, and I don't know if he even, he didn't really even deny this, that, you know, guys, you know, especially Lawler, if we make it, if we're real successful, I'll make you a partner. Well, six years later, Jared had not offered and Lawler had not asked. I get. I don't know who was waiting on what, and you know, Jerry, not the most business-minded guy, Jerry Lawler. Jerry Jarrett built a mansion. Where was Lawler living? Well, I mean, he wasn't under a bridge either. He had a nice place down in Memphis. He's had several of them. But it, the, the thing is, this house. Have we talked about Jarrett's house? Eighteen. You, you were the 000. official photographer, weren't you? Yes, I still have pictures here of this fucking place. <laughs> 18,000 square feet, custom built, on a mountaintop of 100 acres outside of Hendersonville, Tennessee, way past where all the country music stars lived, into a whole different (coughs) stratosphere. He had his own ponds and his own forests and the whole nine yards. The front doors of this house were 12 to 15 feet tall. There was a ballroom indoors where they could have balls one wing was yeah one wing was uh, his office and then the other way was the living area it was massive and when you saw that i mean you know he had bobby bear the country star playing in under a tent in his backyard at the house warming and then bobby had to go back down the hill to his little place that he had so that instigated lawler and lance as you said they were gonna fucking open their own office. And they had that legendary meeting behind closed doors at TV that one morning. And God, I, I look back for the date, but it was <clears throat> Marchish, And they went in to tell Jerry Jarrett that they were leaving and they came out. Lawler was 50% partner. Lance got a raise of some description and long lasting heat from Jarrett over that. Who but even, he, oh, I mean, the heat was so bad, he later claimed that he gave Lance a pay cut after that. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't, no, he didn't. 
Um, I guarantee you, because Lance at that point, he was already, he was, Lance was, I don't want to say always old, but Lance was almost at retirement age at that point. He would, he was already retired, wasn't he? Well, he, he retired in effect from television, from being program director and working at stations to just do wrestling. So anyway, but then there was too many guys. That's when I was managing Adrian and Jesse Barr and the Sheep Herders were the heel tag team that Dundee had brought in. And they did an eight-man loser leave town match, and they all left in one night. And I, got, I ended up with Danny Davis and Ken Wayne, the Galaxians. And then... Yeah, they all left in one night, including the Booker. Has yeah, well, no, no. It, <laughs> it wasn't one night. I know, I know, I know. Because that's what they had to do something. Lawler had insisted on getting the book as part of this power play. And that affected me because Lawler and Jimmy Hart were inextricable. It was the top angle and had been in the in the territory, and it was going to continue to be until Jimmy left. But and Dundee knew that Lawler, even though Dundee worked with Hart many times, had many programs with his guys, Lawler was the one that was always going to get final say on Jimmy Hart. If he if he was going to get beat up, Lawler was going to do it. Whatever. With me, I could be the manager that he was the sole perpetrator of beating up. And so that's why he worked the angle with Adrian because it got heat with him working with Adrian and also because that way it was separate from what Lawler was doing with Jimmy. Well, then, you know, when Lawler takes a book back over, it's all circle uh, revolving around Jimmy again, which was legitimate because he was the hottest manager in any territory in the fucking business. But that didn't help me any. So that's when all of Lawler's guys that he had booked to come into the, his his territory, moon dogs and the grapplers and all these guys, they were there and Jared had too many guys, too many mouths to feed. That's when Ole Anderson had called him because Ole had the problem that his Ohio and Michigan, West Virginia, Northern tours were doing okay. And his Atlanta shows were okay, but he didn't want to run the Georgia towns anymore. The old Georgia territory, they had... You know, Ole's booking at that point, talent, uh, attrition, whatever was going on. This is 83. Barnett was pushed out Christmas 82. Yeah. Barnett had gone. So, and, and Fred Ward and those guys were probably making noise and squealing like pigs stuck under a gate in Columbus and Macon. So anyway, Georgia and the regular Georgia towns were open. And we've done deep dives on this. You can go back on the YouTube channel. But Dundee did the Loser Leave Town match with Lawler that set a gate record in Memphis. One of the great matches I've seen live of all time. And Dundee leaves to go be the booker for Ole's Georgia territory and brings me and a bunch of the preliminary guys, honestly, from Tennessee to populate that world. And as we recalled in the deep dive, it lasted about six to eight weeks. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and we did some really outlaw shows during that point in time. Hey, can I and ask it, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go well, I'm just going to say it didn't work. Go ahead. If none of this had happened, where Lawler and Lance got curious about the money and talent was called, would the Rock and Roll Express have been created? Ooh, very good question, and the answer probably is no. Because Ricky and Robert, Ricky was working in San Antonio teaming with Ken Lucas, right? And Robert right. had been somewhere, but they had not been teaming with each other. And then when, you know, Ricky had called and asked if he could come back, and Lawler booked him, and I think Robert, same thing independently, but they ended up, you know, coming back to the territory at the same time, and they made a secondary rock and roll MTV style tag team to the fabulous ones so they could go on the secondary towns and the spot shows. And that became the Rock and Roll Express. So, no, if that hadn't happened, probably not, because they were in two different places. And Lawler was booking, I don't know if Dundee would have had his had his finger on the pulse of MTV at that point, but Jimmy Hart is the one who suggested it to Lawler. <laughs> he was still wearing his jumpsuits, I think. Yeah, he was He was still Elvis in 77. Um, 
But anyway, but yeah, so that's that's the thing is that when we went to Georgia, the the promise was made, and of course there was a lot of promises made in wrestling in various places, but no, if it doesn't work, you guys can come back. Well, the thing is, two months later, Dundee had lost this huge loser leave town match with Lawler in every town, Memphis, Louisville, Evansville, Lexington, Nashville, and it sold out or set a gate record in every town. And he couldn't just come back two months later. So they had to just put Dundee on the spot shows. He couldn't make the, he hadn't lost loser leave town matches in Columbia, Tennessee, but he couldn't make any of the big towns. And then for us, what had happened was even before the guys came back, and I'm talking about Jerry Novak, who was one of the bounty hunters, and Frank Morell, the angel, and Bobby Fulton and Terry Taylor were the fantastic ones for Georgia, and Kenny Wayne was the stray cat because he'd been watching my Tiger Mask videos, and Carl Fergie, Lawler's cousin, who would end up refereeing for us in Louisiana. Hey, <laughs> you know, the, the go ahead. Where did he get a Tiger Mask mask? He had somebody make it. Because it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a legitimate one, obviously. It wasn't, but where no, did he it get... wasn't a legitimate one. I mean, you know, I don't know if his wife at the time, Cindy or girl Cindy, may have made it, but it. He was doing. Of course, Ken was acrobatic for the time, but he wasn't Sayama, so I mean, he was doing the kind of trying to do the elementary tiger mask stuff, and people in these small spot shows, you know, they hadn't seen it anyway, so they didn't know what it looked like, but. B -b -b yeah, boy. It made sense. Tiger Mask is Tiger yeah. Mask. The stray cat like wrestles like he's in a an alley. Yeah. Every once in a while, he'd try to do the thing where he'd 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 go to dive out of the ropes and then spin back in like Sayama would do and land on his feet. But he'd get one leg stuck on the middle rope and kind of hobble in. Hey, that was tough. He, that was tough for even Sayama. Sorry to cut you off. That was tough yeah. for even Sayama. Remember when he wrestled in the garden against Dynamite Kid because the ropes were so loose, he had trouble doing it. Well, that's because they were using cables. In uh, Noki's company at that time, same thing, cables and ropes, different shit. The flyers will flounder. But nevertheless, so that's uh, all these guys, right? And me. And I think when <laughs> when we all were turned away from Georgia and came back, I, I guess Jerry felt like for various reasons, well, my mom will get mad at me if I don't book Cornette. And, you know, I got to tell you, but by that point, Lawler had brought so many guys into the territory, they had started running two towns four or five nights a week. So Memphis would usually be the only town that run. And you go back in the summer of 83, I think it was from maybe from Memorial Day until Labor Day, they didn't do less than 30 grand on shows that summer, but there were almost 40 guys on the fucking cards. And so a lot of guys were just getting the $50 minimum because Jarrett wasn't going to suddenly... Said so there was the disconnect. Dundee booked more cost efficiently. Fewer guys on the roster. Lawler liked to have... He didn't want to say no to people. He liked to have all the guys that he liked around, Plowboy Frazier, whatever the fuck. So you had a bunch of guys, and Jarrett's still going to... The same... The pie is the same. He's going to cut the slices smaller, right? So anyway, when we come back, they make me, the they bring me back out on Memphis t TV and make me Jimmy Hart's like second in command, like the lieutenant of the first family. And because Lawler at that point had just said, fuck it, all the heels in the territory are in the first family. Jimmy manages everybody. Well, he can't go to two towns. So I was the one that would go out with all the heels that are in the first family on the spot shows. While Jimmy was in Louisville, I'd be in hoo-ha Mississippi, and if Jimmy was in Lexington, I'd be in Osceola, Arkansas, or whatever the case, and that was how we got wormed back onto the shows, and it wasn't until the end of the year, Thanksgiving time, or close to, when Watts came up, that Jarrett came back and said, okay, I've got too many guys on the cards. I'm paying too many guys. The wintertime slows down usually anyway. Bill, take some of my talent. Jerry, don't bring any more in. And we're going to downsize this thing. 
And we ended up all getting jobs making five times as much money as we'd been making before because they had too many guys in the Tennessee territory and we weren't important there. But, and that was, the, <laughs> that was the fucking thing is that when the night that Watts came, I'd have to go back and look at the card, but there were 30 guys on the card then, right? And they had multiple heel teams and multiple babyface teams and, you know, a lot of different guys. But the thing that was different about that night is Jerry Jarrett came in. He hadn't handled the finishes in Memphis personally since earlier in the year that I'd experienced. And he came in and, and did everybody's finish and told them how he wanted the match to go. And so, okay, we're going to get longer heat with multiple hope spots like we used to in the old days. And he was trying to tell the guys, basically, we're going to work more professionally because Watts is here. And he gave me 18 million things to do that night. I hadn't been so involved in goddamn ages. I thought, fuck, they're going to use me again. No, he was auditioning me to get rid of me. And it worked, thankfully. So anyway. This period of time is why fans, if anyone sees footage of you and Andy Kaufman, it was from when you were the second to Jimmy Hart. Yes. And whenever Andy was on TV, he'd come out with us or... Sometimes I wasn't even making TV at that point, but also I would the night that oh god damn it, what did we do now? There was a night where I went out as a distraction while Andy Kaufman came through the front door while Jimmy was getting beat up or whatever the fuck. So I got to like peripherally do a little shit with them, but you know, I was the Again, instead of being the low man on the totem pole earlier in the year, as far as experience level and, you know, just greenness and newness, now I was really the least important person in this territory. So that, anyway, August 40 years ago was when I came back from Georgia and started back again in Memphis. And would you like to hear it? It might not take long. No, let's do <laughs> well, I don't know what that means, but let's hear it. Yeah. All right. Remember again, I said at the top of this, in January, I worked 28 out of 31 days, four double shots. <laughs> Here, August one, two, three off. Because we were winding down the Georgia territory. I'd actually been off, good God, I'd been off July 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29. And then we were still committed to Chattanooga on July 30th. I did that. And then I was off on the 31st, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And so the territory is folding up in Georgia. Thursday, August 4th, we were in Adairsville, Georgia, which was a 400-mile round trip. I'd already moved back to Nashville, right? And the house was $1,200, which means Oof. I think the the average ticket price would at there would have probably been $4.50, so a couple hundred people, which was in those days, unheard of for a real professional wrestling event. I managed Kenny Wayne as the stray cat against Carl Fergie and Jerry Novak and the angel uh, against the fantastic ones. And I made $65 because that had been our guaranteed minimum. We'd get 65 bucks a night, at least five days a week. The five days a week went away when they closed the territory, the 65 bucks stayed. And then I, w I went back that night to Nashville. I was off on Friday, but I was at Memphis TV on Saturday morning, so I drove down on Friday night, 200 miles, and did Memphis TV where I was reintroduced as the, you know, the new uh, second lieutenant of the first family. And then we still had to go to Gadsden, Alabama for the Georgia Territory, another finish-up show. <laughs> 280 fucking miles from Memphis to Gadsden, Alabama, which I drove myself because everybody was going their different directions out of this territory, trying to get back to their homes or potentially rent new apartments. $1,500 house. I got 65 bucks. And this time uh, I managed Pat Rose uh, over Carl Fergie and the fantastic ones beat Novak and the Angel. Then I drove to Atlanta, which was 130 miles, because the next day we were in Marietta, our last show there. Guess who beat 
Carl Fur. No, I'm sorry. I didn't manage Pat Rose against Fergie. I managed Fergie, and he got beat by Pat Rose. Guess who beat Carl Fergie in Marietta, Georgia on August 7, 1983, with me in Fergie's corner? And it wasn't Pat Rose? Fella named Arn Anderson. Really? Well, yeah, this kid we'd hardly ever heard of. He was already named Arn Anderson? He had just started. And as a matter of fact, the night, hold on. Where was it? The last night we were in Columbus, Georgia. He was on the card on July 20th. And I remember Dundee didn't like fucking Fred Ward anyway. And did anyone? That's, well, and that's where I believe we found out that day. You know what? We found out that day because Wednesday was promo day. So we found out that day that this thing was closing down. So he, Dundee did something where Arn was the only one that was going to stay. And so Arn Anderson went out that night and beat up like everybody on the whole card. At the end of the night. <laughs> anyway, so Marietta, I didn't even record the fucking house. I got a motel for $23 in metropolitan Atlanta, though, 40 years ago. So... Uh, by the way, for that first week of August, I made $195. And you know what that is? In today's money, still the shits. <laughs> and then I was off on Monday, August 8th. Tuesday, August 9th, we were in Cookville, Tennessee. Which was, the house was $1,800, and it was a $50 payoff. Because these are the two last shows. Remember I told you that the last shows from that Georgia territory, I think Ronnie West just ran them and they, they just tried to get some of the money back that they'd fucking him and Dundee had put in because they were true outlaw shows. The office didn't know we were doing it still. They didn't honor the $65 minimum. <laughs> Cookville, Tennessee on August 9th and McMinnville, Tennessee on August 11th. Uh, we got 50 bucks a piece. I managed two different matches. And the combined houses were $3,300 for both shows. You just said something that was interesting. How much money did Dundee and Ronnie West put into the promotion? And what? Well, I, I don't think they had, they didn't have money in it per se. What they had, they had moved both of them, had uh, relocated, and, and Dundee got an apartment. He still had a house in Nashville, but he'd got a place down in Atlanta at the Falcon's Rest. And then I think he moved with the uh, the baby faces. He got an apartment. And Ronnie West had been, he'd been working as a manager at a goddamn Wendy's for 400 bucks a week back then. And he fucking gave that up to come and do this. And then Ole pulls the rug out from under him after six months or six weeks. I think they said, fuck, we'll just run these fucking shows. <laughs> the office doesn't know we're doing it. The sponsors at the high schools are none the wiser, and we'll just get some of our fucking money back. That's what I think. Anyway, then I was off August the 12th, and then the 13th was my first official night back in the Tennessee Territory in Nashville where the house was $8,400. That was the same as the previous fucking five shows I'd worked combined. And I managed the Galaxian over Mad Dog Boyd. Uh, Adrian Street was back at that point. Remember, he came back briefly. And he drew with the, the, the Jaguar, who was Danny Davis. He was doing his own. He was from the jungles of Guatemala. He was Tiger Mask too. <laughs> And I managed Roger Smith and Donnie Bass, the Assassins, over Spike Huber and Dutch Mantell. And then I managed the Grapplers, Lynn Denton and Tony Anthony, in a no contest with Steve Kurt and Terry Taylor. And guess how much I got paid? How much? $50. Because <laughs> they're like, fuck it, maybe we can starve him out and run him off. He'll quit and go back to taking pictures. Anything to read? Is it just symbolic, the fact that you guys all start back in Nashville? Um, well, that's because, yes, the symbolic thing is, now that Lawler firmly has control of the book and Jimmy Hart's his top manager, they were in Jonesboro that night, 75 miles from home, instead of going up to the goddamn sports arena in Nashville, 400-and-something mile round trip, for an $8,400 house in Nashville when they probably had six in Jonesboro. So that's what that was. 
And uh, then Sunday the 14th, I was off. And Monday the 15th, I was off because they had too many guys already in Memphis and Jimmy Hart was there. But Tuesday night, August 16th, when they normally run the Louisville Gardens in my hometown of Louisville, Kentucky, guess where I was at? The Louisville Gardens? No, Batesville, Mississippi. Ooh. Because the Louisville Gardens was going to do $20,000 and Batesville, Mississippi did $2,400. Jimmy Hart and Lawler were both motivated to make that trip. So for $50 in front of about 400 people, I managed the Angel against Tommy Gilbert. I managed Alpha the Galaxian against Eddie Gilbert. I managed the Bruise Brothers against the Rock and Roll Express and the Moon Dogs against Stagger Lee, Coco Ware, and Bobby Eaton. Was and any- I got fifty more dollars. Go ahead. Was anyone else at the time complaining? I know you were a young guy in the business, and I don't know how many people would just do this out in the open outside of the car. Everybody in the fucking locker room was like, what the fuck? We're in fucking Batesville instead of Louisville. It's $50 versus, I mean, the rock and roll. Uh, even at that time, Bobby, the Moon Dogs, they would have been $200, $250 guys on a $27,000 Louisville house. And then Wednesday, the 17th, I was off because they didn't have another town besides Evansville. And then Thursday, the 18th, I was in Somerville, Tennessee for $50 in a $2,800 house. I managed Duke Myers, who was the Prince of Darkness at that point, against Mad Dog Boyd. Tommy Rogers beat Adrian Street. The Rock and Roll Express beat the Bruise Brothers. And the Assassins beat Jerry Lawler and Terry Taylor by disqualification. Lawler was in Somerville on a Thursday night because it was... 50 miles from Memphis. Who was in charge of these shows on site? Um, that would, well, the was it Buddy Wayne? Oh, okay. But well, the promoter, here's the thing. The promoter was in charge. Whoever the promoter was of the spot show was in charge of anything to do with the building and the box office. And either Lawler, uh, who was the booker would give the finishes, give the, tell the referee, go over and tell the heels, whatever the fuck, or, if Jimmy Hart was there and Lawler wasn't, Jimmy would probably have him. But otherwise, somebody like Jerry Calhoun for a spot show like this, Lawler would call him Calhoun. Here's the card. Put the baby faces over. Don't let fucking so and so pull his pants down. Whatever. That was the sum total of who was in charge of this shit. And you just know, okay, it's the rock and roll and the Bruise Brothers. That's pork chop cash and the dream machine. Well, no, wait. It wasn't Dream yet because it was still Porkchop and Mad Dog. I was going to say, you said Mad Dog Boyd was there before against the Galaxian. That must have been a barn burner. Oh, boy. So, you know, the whoever the chief heel was, Porkchop in that instance, or Roger and Donnie, one of them would say, well, tell them we're going to, you know, we'll do about 15 minutes and we'll send them a finish or whatever. It was just that that simple. Nobody was going to fucking... It's goddamn Somerville, Tennessee. There's 400 fucking people or less. Anyway, then went to Nashville that night because I've moved back to Nashville. But guess where I was on Friday, August 19th? Hohenwald, Tennessee. Hey, I know yes, that place. Yes, our old hometown, Hohenwald, Tennessee. This time, the house was $3,000. They did about 600 people. That was a Buddy Wayne town, I remember specifically. And it was only 80 miles from Nashville, and I got 75 whole dollars because I managed again four times. And then after that show, went to Memphis, which was 170 miles, had to do TV and stand in the corner while Jimmy did the interview on the morning of the 20th, and then... That night, I was in Osceola, Arkansas. And I remember this one specifically because Lawler was on the card. It was that or go to Nashville. So because Lawler was on the card in Osceola, it was a $4,500 house. That was a thousand fucking people at those ticket prices in those days, especially with kids. So I got a hundred bucks. And I not only... One, two, I not only managed three times, I wrestled twice. 
it was supposed to be um, me and Jimmy Hart, I believe, in a handicap match against King Cobra, but Jimmy wasn't there, so Porkchop Cash filled in. So me and Porkchop Cash had a handicap match against King Cobra. He makes the fucking comeback. He bumps Porkchop to the floor, and he's supposed to headbutt me and pin me, right? As I'm staggering over to him, he grabs my arm, and he starts to shoot me off. And as he shoots me off, he says, power slam. I hit the fucking ropes. I hooked the ropes and put my legs crossed under me and tripped on purpose and fell at his fucking feet face first. <laughs> and when he went to pick me up, I looked up at him and said, I don't know how to do that shit. Because <laughs> I'd had not one wrestling fucking lesson, as I believe I mentioned before, and he's a shit power slam. What the fuck? How am I supposed to come in for that shit, right? And I didn't want him doing it to begin with. <laughs> so he headbutted me and pinned me. <laughs> and then <laughs> Plowboy Frazier was the giant rebel in the giant Confederate general's uniform. And I managed him, uh, and he beat Ken Wayne the Stray Cat. And then, Mad, no, Mad Dog had turned on the Bruise Brothers. By then, it was Pork Chop and Dream, because it was Pork Chop and Dream Machine against Stagger Lee and Mad Dog. And then Lawler beat the Prince of Darkness, and then I was out second in the Battle Royal. Stagger Lee not being the Mid-South Stagger Lee. Stagger Lee being Coco Ware. And... And then I drove four, four and a half hours, 270 miles back to Nashville. But a hundred dollar payoff, I spent six dollars at Wendy's and spent 13 bucks on gas. So how much were you paying for rent in Nashville and where were you living? Well, that's another thing. My rent on my, the first apartment that I got in Nashville was up in Madison, Tennessee, which was, it was, I don't know what it's like now, but back then this was a brand new apartment complex and a nice little suburb and my rent was $285 a month because this was 1983. So I was spending my my money I had saved from photography, but I was still in the game here at this point. But by the way... And you weren't I, doing the photography, though. Well, no, and now since I went to Georgia, the photography had been cut off. So I was suspending... I was suspending. I was spending the money that I had saved doing the photography. But my first week in August, 195 bucks. Second week, 150 dollars. Third week, 275 dollars. I'm farting through silk again now. So then, Monday, August 22nd, Westmoreland, Tennessee, and that was a Buddy Wayne town. Because I'll never forget. Because I said, Buddy, I've never even heard of Westmoreland. It is a small spot on the map. And he said, "What, well, Jim, it was named after General Westmoreland, and he proceeded to give me this World War II fucking, or Civil War General's whole goddamn biography or whatever. But anyway, I managed the Angel against Bobby Fulton, Prince of Darkness against Tom Pritchard, and the Grapplers against the Fabulous Ones. Westmoreland, Tennessee did a $4,800 house. Now that's against, by the way, it, it may have been against Memphis. If it wasn't, we just weren't there. Uh, that week, but $4,800, that's a little over a thousand people counting the kids' tickets at the high schools back then. I got 75 bucks. What was the date of that show? August 22nd. I woke up Memphis. See if we, uh, see if they were in Memphis on the 21st or the 22nd that week. And uh, because the 23rd, if they were in Louisville, I wasn't, I was in Huntington, Tennessee, where, where the house was $2,000 or probably about 400 450 people and the payoff was $50 managed three more times. I uh, was off. Uh, go ahead. I have some results here. Yes. August 22nd, 1983 Memphis, Tennessee, mid South Coliseum pork chop cash beat Tommy Gilbert dream machine drew the Jaguar. Susan star beat Judy Martin. Tommy Rogers beat Adrian street. The moon dogs beat Terry Taylor and Bobby Eaton. Buddy Landell defeated Stagger Lee, and in the main event, Ken Patera and the Assassins beat Jimmy Valiant, Austin Idol, and Jerry Lawler. Oh, God damn it! I should have remembered that. You know, does it have the... Are you looking at the newspaper clipping from Mark James's book or just the results? Oh, no, I just looked at the results. I don't have the book in front okay, of me. Okay, that was the night 
they fucking sold out the Coliseum. That was Jimmy Valiant's return. If you go back and look at the at the tape that they played on TV the next week, Jimmy Valiant, I think that's the summer that he had been scheduled to return once and he got sick and couldn't and drew a big house and they almost fucking burned the place down. And then the angle with the assassins and Patera and Lawler and Idol had gotten so hot they brought Jimmy in as a special partner. And the house that night, it was 11,000 people, did over $40,000, and all of us were in Westmoreland, Tennessee, <laughs> making $75 and $100 a piece because there was 40 guys in the territory. Same fucking night. Would it have been more painful if there were cell phones and guys in one locker room were sending oh, good photos God. to the other locker room? Oh, my God. You know, because, again, there every time a dream machine was on one of these, he buttermilk. Run a buttermilk run, buttermilk. And then the next night, instead of Louisville, I was in Huntington, Tennessee. That was only a $2,000 house, as I said. Managed three more times. That was a 250-mile round trip from fucking Nashville. To be off on Wednesday, because they were in Evansville. Princeton, Kentucky, on Thursday night, August 25th. Listen to this one. And again, th there was another town running that night. But listen to these names. I managed the Angel. In a draw against Tommy Gilbert, I managed Adrian Street, and he got beat by Tommy Rogers. I managed Buddy Landell. He got beat by Coco Ware on DQ. I managed the Grapplers. They got beat by Robert Gibson and Bobby Eaton by uh, disqualification. And I managed the Moondogs, who lost to Bobby Eaton and Spike Huber on a reverse decision. One, two, three, four, five... It, I think, as a matter of fact, there was a, there, the girls were in that week. You just uh, talked about them in, um, on the Memphis show. The only matches that I wasn't going out for were the girls' matches. And this was the middle of the fucking summer in these unair conditioned goddamn <laughs> school gyms. I was almost a, at a stroke every night, right? But what fucking practice? And then, oh, Friday night, August 26th, Springfield, Tennessee. Hometown of the wild-eyed Southern boy, Tracy Smothers, it was 25 miles from Nashville. And that's why Lawler and Jimmy Hart didn't want to go because they had to be at Memphis TV the next morning. But the house was $4,800. That was over 1,000 people in Springfield. And listen to this. Pork Chop Cash beat Tommy Gilbert. The Dream Machine beat the Jaguar. The Bruise Brothers and the Prince of Darkness beat the Jaguar, Tommy Gilbert, and Don Anderson. Tom Pritchard beat Buddy Landell by DQ. And the Fabulous Ones beat the Grapplers by DQ. So I managed five matches again that night and then got in a car and drove 240 miles to Memphis to be at TV at 10 o'clock the next morning. And then actually got to go to Jonesboro on that Saturday night. I don't know why. But I was there. Was, and Jim, the house, was Jimmy Hart off? Well, apparently Jimmy Hart nor Lawler was there. And I would have to think either they were in Nashville or just on fucking vacation. Because Lawler would go to Nashville if it was a big main event against Ken Patera or whatever the case, right? If they booked that occasionally there. So this time in Jonesboro, Porkchop drew Taylor. Dennis Condry, I managed him, beat Bobby Fulton. The Bruce Brothers got beat by Bobby Eaton and Robert Gibson. I think Ricky was hurt at that period. Uh, the Moondogs got beat by Bobby Eaton and Terry Taylor. And the Grapplers got beat by the Fabulous Ones. And I was fucking tired. I got $90. That works out to... Fuck, that's not $20 a match. And then drove 300 miles back to Nashville. Going into everything we talked about to set up August, how did... Bobby was there in 82, but how did Dennis get the call to come in? Dennis and Norvell had come back as a team, as the Midnight Express, without Randy in the, I believe, the summertime or early fall, right as I was coming back independently from Georgia. Because when, uh, or Dennis may have come first and then brought Norvell to replace the Grapplers. As a, as a heel team in the territory. But nevertheless... They went to what, Southwest? 
they went to Southwest, yes, to work for the Blanchards. And that, and that makes sense because Ricky Morton had come from Southwest, so Lawler was talking to whoever was, but maybe Tully, whoever was wor- booking for Blanchard at that point. And, you know, it just made sense that, that they would go back and forth, but Dennis always tried to stay around the Tennessee Territory if he could. He had rotated between the Knoxville Territory, the Memphis Territory, and the Nashville Territory for most of his career, and as I had always done well. But in this case, he came in and quickly saw that there's too many guys here and what the fuck, but he was in the right place for two or three months later for Watts to show up. And at the time, you knew Dennis's work would catch Watts's eye because he, in ring, he was the most probably all-around professional, solid, could-do-anything impressed a promoter or a guy with Watts's eye than almost anybody else on the card. They said, you know, Lawler being the box office guy, but he couldn't, he couldn't have Lawler. And, uh, but anyway, finishing up the month of August with a bang, not Memphis, not Louisville, not Evansville, but Brownsville, Kentucky on a Monday, August 29th, $4,900. They were drawing a thousand people on these spot shows. We, I just wasn't making any money off of it. And then Tuesday, August 30th, Water Valley, Mississippi, which was a 600-mile round trip from fucking Nashville. And some of these towns I'd started to make with Bobby Eaton, even though he was a babyface, we'd sneak and do it uh, because it was so fucking far. And, and some guys that were booked in those things down there were staying in Memphis. So... It was hard to get rides or whatever, but I, Water Valley on Tuesday, and then the 31st, the last day of the month, was Nashville, a shitty card, without Lawler. <laughs> the house did $2,745. I made 50 bucks. But that was, the last week of August was my biggest week of the month, $340. And it would get worse from there uh, before Watts came up. But they they couldn't run me off because... I still had money in the bank and it wasn't like I was going to quit of my, on my own. So God damn, have, hold, hold on though. Here's a run for you. As I just flip forward, September 26, Powderly, Kentucky powder. I don't even know where that is now. I was there then <laughs> and it did $6,102. What'd you say the date was September 26, 1983. They managed to to do almost fifteen hundred people in wherever Powderly, Kentucky is. I don't have the results here because due to the Mid South Fair, the show was moved to the Cook Convention Center, so I got to go to a different place to find those. Well, and Tuesday, September twenty seventh, I was in Faulkner, Mississippi, and that was a Plowboy Frazier promoted town. I remember it because it was at least ten miles off the paved road. <laughs> I'm not shitting you. It was in a big tin building in a an entirely African American community, ten miles off a paved road. They did seventeen hundred dollars. I managed one, two, three, four, five matches, including Lawler and Plowboy Frazier over the Bruise Brothers, and made fifty dollars. And then it that was so good, they did it in Coahoma, Mississippi, the next night. That did even worse. It did a thousand fucking dollars. Those are the only two shows Plowboy Frazier ever ran that I remember. Well, I was going to ask you that. How many other shows did he ever run, and how did he get Lawler to work for him? Because Lawler loved Frazier. And, oh, come on, King, work on my show. I'm going to promote Faulkner and Coahoma. Those are my people. I'm going to get them all in there. And it was 50 miles from Memphis. So and that was the two shows that <laughs> that fucking... Plowboy Frazier promoted in his run as a promoter there. And then September 29th, I was in Smith's Grove, Kentucky, where, um, believe it or not, Jeff Van Camp was on the card. Uh, And then I was in Springfield again on the 30th. Yeah, I was making all the garden spots. And this is when Jesse Ventura was in. You drove him around, right? Um, That happened. Hold on here. Wasn't at the when end of September, to, October? That was yes, because well, I'll go ahead here. Because I actually got to go back to Memphis on a couple of these things. I'm trying to remember. And I was also 
in, in the night I took him to Jonesboro. When would that have been? Or would that have been earlier in the summer? Hold on here. Ah. I don't know. Well, maybe hold on here. I was in Memphis on October 31st. That was the Halloween show. That didn't do very well anyway. Ventura had already left. No, here, Lawler and Ventura. Here's what it is. I was in Memphis on November 7th. And then, <laughs> here's a fucking rib for you. I didn't even remember that. I thought it was Jonesboro. They booked Jesse Ventura, the former or the future governor of Minnesota, in Harrisburg, Arkansas. He was in Memphis on November 7th. And then the next day, that's where I picked him up and took him to the spot show, Harrisburg, Arkansas. It was on election day. November 8th was election day. Where's the future governor of Minnesota? He's working with Jerry Lawler in Harrisburg, Arkansas, in front of a thousand people. That's my constitutional right. <laughs> Hey, what do you remember about this match? I'm looking a little forward. October 31st, 83 at the Mid-South Coliseum. Bobby Eaton, Bobby Fulton, the Jaguar, and James Daniels beat Carl Fergie, Lucifer, the Russian Invader, and Jim Cornette. Exactly. <laughs> I was in the opening. Here's the thing. Jerry Jarrett was such an economical booker. In his heyday, when he was drawing big money in Louisville and Lexington and Memphis, he had four or five matches on the card. And then Lawler, he had so many guys. The opening match in the Coliseum was an eight-man or ten-man tag team match. And then it went up from there, eight, nine matches. So, yeah, Bobby Eaton had nothing going on. The Jaguar, Danny Davis, nothing going on. Bobby Fulton, James Daniels, I barely remember him. He was a kid I think they trained. Lucifer was Frank Morrell in a devil mask. Carl Fergie, the Russian invader, was Jerry Novak, the bounty hunter. And me, because they wanted to get me on the card. I, maybe to, to fucking carry Ventura to the show the next day. I don't fucking know. I'd asked, because if, if there was another show running against Memphis and I was on that, okay, I can't complain. But when the weeks I would be off, right, when Memphis was running and there just wasn't any room... Um, you know, then I was like, fuck, cause that could be half of like the week of the 17th through the 23rd, I made $420 because I worked Pickwick, Tennessee, Bowling Green, Kentucky, and was off Wednesday and Thursday and made Louisville. But I got Memphis on the Monday night and it was a $30,000 house. I made 200 bucks. That's where me and Jimmy beat Bobby Eaton in the handicap match. They threw the money out and caused a riot and the fucking fan knocked me out. So I started asking Lawler, you know, ahead of time, can, can I be on Memphis next week? You got anything for me, right? So the week that they put me on the Memphis show here is the next day I had driven goddamn Jesse around. But one time they had me booked on what a Buddy Wayne shows in like Northern Mississippi on a Tuesday night. And I was like, Oh geez, I'm off Monday. That's a 600 and something mile round trip. I'll have to make it by myself. I called buddy up thinking if I kind of play on his heartstrings, you know, then I'll, he can put the word in for me and get me on Memphis. So I called buddy on the phone. I said, and this is not the buddy Wayne, by the way, the, this is the original buddy Wayne, not the buddy Wayne. That's the father of Nick Wayne from Washington state. It's the, the buddy Wayne from Memphis. It was a wrestler from the fifties on and promoted and looked like Jerry Clower. I said, buddy, I said, I'd love to make, you know, water Valley for you, Mississippi on, on Tuesday. But boy, you know, the thing is I'm, I'm not on Memphis and, Everybody else would be down there. I have to ride by myself and don't really have a lot of money for gas because I hadn't been booked too much lately. Leading the witness, right? You know what he said to me, Brian? What? He said, oh, Jim, that's okay. He said, don't make Water Valley. How's going to be shits anyway? I said, oh, goddamn. I was trying to get me another booking. I got canceled out of the one I had. The fuck? So I never did that again. Hey, here's a tag team that stands out from that October 31st, 83 show. 
the Southern Tag Champs Dream Machine and Pork Chop Cash beat Tommy Rogers and Coco Ware. Were they good? Oh, I just thought. <laughs> what? I just Tommy Rogers and Coco Ware. I just thought of the uh, who was it? Coco had to dig them deal with. Right, it was Kern. Oh yeah, Steve okay. Kern and Coco Ware. Right. Okay. They're trying to put Coco with all the fucking fantastics and fabulouses because there's Tommy Rogers is about to be the fantastic one because Terry Taylor got extricated out of that when he came back from Georgia and Bobby, that's why Bobby Fulton had no partner because Jerry Jarrett liked Terry Taylor as a single, but Bobby Fulton had always been an underneath guy in Memphis. So um, Dundee loved both of them. He loved Bobby Fulton. And he, he thought a lot of Tommy Rogers' work. So when Tommy had come in as a single there and they put him with Coco, um, when Dundee needed the Fantastics in Louisiana, he thought of Tommy Rogers and put him together with Bobby. That's how that came about. Also on the show, the Assassins beat Robert Reed and Ken Raper to win the CWA tag title. Yes. And that, that was a deal they had done on TV the previous morning where the, the, the angle was between the Fabulous Ones and the Assassins for the world, tag, the world Tag Team title. And the Fabs had come out and caused Robert Reed, who took over some of my photography chores in Tennessee and was a friend of Lawler's, played on the softball team, and Ken Raper, same, with the unfortunate last name, that was his real given Christian name, but why not change it if you're going into something with the public because paying attention? Nobody even thought of it in that context back then. And, you know, it, it, I never even heard anybody say anything about it. Until we, it's like the Fabulous Ones videos that Jared did. We look at them 40 years later and go, my God, it's the most homoerotic bunch of bullshit we've ever seen in our life. But back then, the fucking women were hanging all over them. Back then, you're like, this is what rock and roll is supposed to be on MTV. It's completely different perceptions. Anyway. The Fabs caused the job guys to beat the Assassins for the World Tag Team title. And then that caused mucho consternation amongst the Assassins, who then beat Reed and Raper to get the belts back and then had the lights out match with the Fabulous Ones. Was it the November 7th show that Watts came in for? I, th I believe it was. All right, now that, now that you've got the date in front of me here, since we're going on about this, we, all we've got is regular wrestling to talk about. November 7th, yes, uh, and the house was $16,000, which that was bad for Memphis because it was, you know, November started slowing down a little bit. Thanksgiving was not a big season in Tennessee because they didn't do a big annual Thanksgiving event, but uh, Jarrett didn't have the best. That's, that's 4,000 some people in Memphis. According to what's here, it says 4,605. Okay, that's about right. And that wasn't the best house for him to show off, but it was better than some of the towns that Watts was running. So I managed a guy named U.S. Steele, who was this big kid that they'd trained from Nashville. He was, goddamn, what was his real name? Nicest guy. But that was his gimmick, U.S. Steele. He was 300-something pounds. And uh, he, he beat Carl Fergie. And then the Russian invader... Um, no, wait a minute. Hold on here. You didn't manage Carl Fergie? No, it was not. It was, no, I'm, I tell, see, I had his name in front, but it wasn't the seventh watch came. It was the 14th. Oh. It's the 14th. Cause I was looking, I knew I managed the Bruce brothers that night and Condry and Austin. So that's what, that's what it was. The 14th. I managed the moon dogs against Plowboy Frazier in us steel. I managed Condry and Austin when they fucked the fabulous ones for the world tag team title. And that's, um, that's when I jumped in the referee. Goddamn. It was Jim Jameson. He was green and he didn't get distracted and turned around and he had to see me, but I got in and out so quick on the fly that he plausibly may could have not seen me. And that got me some, praise from the guys in the back when they realized that the referee had fucked the deal up but anyway i was the reason why the fabs lost the world tag team title to dennis condry and norvell austin and then when i was managing the bruise brothers later on in the night against the rock and roll express that's when the fabs came out 
and attacked me and gave me a spike pile driver on the concrete floor and put me in a neck brace and I wasn't on TV for a few weeks after that. Where was Watts watching all this? From the back where everybody watched. There was no monitor. Right, but I didn't know if, like, because he wasn't really a recognizable figure there, if he didn't just walk out and watch from amongst the fans or anything. Well, no, I mean, you know, you could go up, especially with a house, and the house that week was only 13 grand, so about the same thing. You could go up into the general admission seats over where the entranceway was, and you could sit up there and watch. Jarrett would do that a lot with, you know, different people, you know, if it wasn't a big house. So that's, they were somewhere in the back. They weren't up at ringside. I'm guessing Watts had other things to do when it was Andy Kaufman and Jimmy Hart against Jerry Lawler in a handicap match. But no, I, I don't know. He may have he may have stayed and watched the whole thing, but he knew he couldn't get any of that talent. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing is he saw Dennis... Condry teaming with Norvell, he saw Bobby that night as a babyface. And he said, why are these guys not together? He was, he could see it. And, and I was just managing all these guys randomly. And Jared had me figured in the finishes just to, like I said, push me and try to give me, you know, an audition. But Watts could see it. He didn't, he didn't necessarily want the fabs. He wanted the rock and roll express. He didn't, he didn't want the established way that guys were being presented. He wanted individual talents, and he saw he could do something else with them. And by the way, Norvell and others on the show, like Tommy Rogers, would come in the Mid-South, just not in that first wave. Yeah. And, and again, it wasn't that everybody that he didn't pick sucked. It was that he saw what he wanted to do with certain people. But that was that. But me, And as a matter of fact, then Thursday, November 17th, in Liberty, Kentucky, would that have been, or would it, no, it was Friday in Glasgow. No, it was Thursday in Liberty. Thursday in Liberty, that's when Dennis came in and said, hey, let me talk to you, <laughs> like L.A. night. And he said, Bill Watts wants us to go to our his territory. And I thought, why are you fucking ribbing me, Dennis? This is cruel. You know I'm unimportant and I'm making no money. How well did you know Dennis at this point? Well, I mean, from being around him, you know, since the Hickerson and Condry days as a photographer, you know, that way, but I hadn't worked with him, but just since I'd, he hadn't been in the territory when I was in the business earlier, and then I'd just come back when he'd just come back in, so I'd not been in the locker room with him more than a few times, but, but he said, no, he said, he wants you, me, and Bobby as a team to go to his territory he says we're going to make between 50 and 100 grand a year a piece and i what and it you know but then dennis has a way of impressing on you that he's not bullshitting you and then i believed him and then i was i was you know holy shit and i never actually talked to anybody else until um well we got i got the plane ticket in the mail that i was told i would get and i talked to dundee when they made the deal that you know, he was going to be the booker. In terms of finishing up, do you officially give notice or is that done for you by either Dennis or Watts? Oh, as as soon as Jarrett was given the word by Watts that he would take me, I was, you know, in the process of being finished up. Um, <laughs> well, the, the, basically, after we made the day before Thanksgiving, uh, Shreveport TV, I came back, I worked Springfield. I worked Memphis TV in Jonesboro. I was in Lexington, Kentucky, the 1st of December. Louisville, the 6th of December. Nashville, the 10th of December. And then Nashville back again on the 17th. Of, that's all the rest I worked in the Tennessee Territory. And the only reason I got the two shows in a row in Nashville was the same old deal. Jimmy and, and Lawler didn't want to come to Nashville, so on December 10th, I managed the grapplers over Jeff Van Camp and Franklin Hayes, who would later become John Tatum, uh, the Russian invader over U.S. Steel, Condry and Austin over Eaton and Dutch Mantell, and, and then the Fabs beat the Bruise Brothers in a cage match. And we came back the next week with the Fabs and Roughhouse Fargo over the Bruise Brothers and me in a cage match in Nashville. Because it was Christmas time and Roughhouse was in visiting the territory. 
And so I got an extra shot that I wouldn't have got because they brought it back so they could beat me in the cage match and have a, a opponent for Rough House. What was that like for you? Fun as shit, except I was scared to death because they convinced me that Rough House was going to try to get color on me. <laughs> and so then the first thing he did was grab me in a headlock and took his thumbnail and run, started running it over my fucking forehead going, watch the blade, oh, motherfucker. <laughs> but then the thing is, he was the stiffest guy on the, on the roster. When he headbutted you, he really did. When he punched you, he really did. Then it hurt. But it was Rough House Fargo. So we, I'm in a cage with Rough House Fargo. I can, I can leave the territory happy now. I've done everything. If he's there, does that mean Jackie's there? Jackie wasn't there. <laughs> no, they couldn't afford Jackie. <laughs> he might have been in Memphis that week. I don't know. But, uh, and, well, as a matter of fact, it would, no, it was 1982. In 1982, it was Jackie and Rough House and I think Handsome Jimmy, Valiant, Christmas week in Louisville against maybe Coco Ware, Bobby Eaton, and Jimmy Hart or somebody of Jimmy Hart's guys. And they did $25,000. That at the ticket price of the time was almost 6,000 people because Rough House had not been to the Louisville Gardens. And I think at that point, uh, seven years and holy shit what a fucking house rough house fargo in louisville at the gardens in the tennessee territory outdrew nick bockwinkle ken patera jesse ventura fucking jack briscoe once um i could go on and on it was amazing all righty well i guess we ought to move forward from the good old days where the business depended on ticket sales and people being interested and the money you made to modern times where it's all about the ratings, Brian. It's all about the TV viewership. It's all about the metrics. It's all about the key demo. And AEW perpetrated a nightmarish dream of the Welsh rarebit fiend on last Wednesday's program look google it kids it, it'll be hilarious if you fucking understand it if you have any context on that line it was bad it was fucking timothy leary guest book this edition and we were wondering you and i where the cliff was going to come that people said i've had all i can stands i can't stands no more because there was so many opportunities so now the time has come we have the documentation from thurston howell the third over at Wrestle Economics or whatever. Wrestle Nomics, I believe is the name. Well, it, it, he it, actually he was a home economics teacher before he switched professions. Thurston was. That's not his name's not even. Well, his name is Thurston, but uh, whatever. Well, see, then don't try to call this guy by some other name that he doesn't have because that'd be, <laughs> be disrespectful. So, what did Thurston have to say about the ratings for Dynamite last Wednesday night, which was the sixteenth or so? AEW Dynamite August 16th on TBS was watched by 874 viewers on average. Uh, excuse me, 874,000 viewers on average. Uh, okay, they, again, that they, they're in the range they've been in. I don't. It's a fucking gift. I don't know how they can coerce people to watch this fucking thing. The state of it, but. Where did they start and where did they finish? Well, they started with this uh, Windsor McKay produced edition of AEW Dynamite. <laughs> Little Nemo. That's right. Quarter one, 8 to 8, 15 p.m. Orange Cassidy versus Wheeler Yuta with picture-in-picture -picture ads. Christ. 946,000 viewers. All right. Well, that's their starting point. Quarter two, 8, 15 to 8, 30 p.m. The post-match with the Blackpool Combat Club beatdown, and then the Best Friends, and then the Lucha Brothers, and then Eddie Kingston all run in. Kenny Omega's sit-down interview with Jim Ross, followed by his attack by Don Callis and the Bullet Club Gold and Takeshita. Followed by Jim Ross. If he had heat vision, all of them would have burst into flames. Followed by Adam Page outside of the hospital. <laughs> Followed by Don Callis and Chris Jericho starting their live promo. 943,000 viewers. Jesus Christ, they stuck around through all of that, eh? 
Good That's right. Lord, the Doug patience McKenzie. that these people have. Well, a? A? Quarter three was A, 30 to 8.45 p.m. The continuation of Don Callis and Chris Jericho's dramatic oil painting segment. <laughs> the Jack Perry video. And Darby Allen and Nick Wayne versus the Gates of Agony. They're each a gate, I guess. 900. Did they swing both ways? 943,000 viewers. Well, wait a minute. What? They're not losing anything for this show, for these nobodies, for this dreck, this effluvia? How can this be? Is Was the, was the Nielsen people, were they stuck on freeze frame? I was going to tune out, but Cash Wheeler stuck a gun in my face. Hey, come on now. That's not right. He said, you better watch this show. Quarter four. It was just a white male with a beard, for all you know. It was just some bearded white guy. 8.45 to 9 p.m. The final two minutes of Nick Wayne and Darby Allen versus the Gates of Agony. The post-match with Swerve Strickland, A.R. Fox, and Sting... The MJF Adam Cole Kangaroo uh, Outback Steakhouse segment with Tony Khan making an appearance. And then the beginning of the Adam Cole MJF live promo in the ring. Now they usually do uh, people stick or come back for MJF and Adam Cole. What happened here? 903,000 viewers. Ooh, okay. They lost 40. Is that the first time that MJF and Cole have lost instead of gaining or at least keeping? It is the first time, I believe, in quite a while. Now, they did 434 in the key demo, which is a little bit off the high, which was quarter two. You have to wonder how much of the craziness on the show may have run anyone off. Well, I was, I was about to say there was a lot of provocation before this for people to leave, but still, that's a, I can't believe they've only lost 43,000 people since the show started for the first hour. That could be a record for AEW. Well, get ready for the big 9 o'clock hour. Quarter 5, 9 to 9, 15 p.m. The continuation of Adam Cole and MJF's live promo. They get attacked by Aussie Open, and Chris Jericho licks his blood in the back. 898,000 viewers. Okay, they stayed mostly flat. That's normal fluctuation. But the average, they have not even gone down to the average yet. So what is left to happen in the next 45 minutes? <laughs> the fun begins. Okay. Quarter six, 9.15 and 9.30 p.m. I can't even say this without smiling. <laughs> Jeff Hardy versus Jeff Jarrett, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre match. Uh-oh. Through picture-in-picture picture and an ad break. 822,000 viewers. Okay, 77,000 people said, oh, this is too much. And they, they got a $100,000 sponsorship for the video game or movie or whatever the fucking thing is these days. The $100,000 is almost a dollar per person that tuned out in some fashion is what I'm trying to say. Well, quarter seven, let's see if the trend continues, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. The Bunny... Versus Britt Baker. Oh boy. With picture in picture. An acclaimed video. And the acclaimed are attacked by the House of Black who steal uh, boots, I believe, this time. The boots. 800,000 viewers. 22,000 more. So now we're down 146,000 from the start of the program. But what was, what was the main event? I can't even remember now. The main event, quarter eight, 9.45 to 10 p.m. An ad break, followed by the Young Bucks versus the Guns. That's right. With picture-in-picture picture and a post-match featuring Bullet Club Gold and FTR. 738,000 viewers. Oh! 62,000 more people said all we've got left is the Buckaroos. Fuck this. And it was the low point in the key demo as well. 358,000 viewers. The low point by far. And the low, po the low point in everything. And they lost 208,000 people from the start of the thing, which is uh, of 946, 208, 460. 
what is that? 22, 23% of the audience from start to finish. Woo, glad they got those new contracts, the Buckaroos, for the, that high salary Tony's paying them because they're doing these kind of numbers. And that was the build-up to All In. I mean, that was FTR confronting them in the ring. That's the build-up to the pay-per-view, which is right around the corner, and they got the lowest amount of viewers the entire show. Did it deserve to have any more viewers? No, but I don't know. The formatting of this show certainly uh, raises Boy, a lot of questions. I, I, I'll tell you what, the luck of the the luck of fools that they held those numbers through that first hour, because if they had done what they normally do, their average would have been even worse. Well, that was AEW Dynamite for Ooh. August 16th, 2023. All right, we're 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 running slightly behind because we've been going a while already. Should we push ahead with the week in wrestling and uh, the Cody documentary from Peacock, Becoming the American Nightmare? We have watched that, and we're going to talk about it, but we might move that to the drive-thru. We'll see wh how much time this takes. But there was a <laughs> SmackDown. We will, we will be moving it to the drive-thru, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, you never know. You never know. There was a SmackDown on Friday night, August 18th. And I know that the first 25 minutes happened because courtesy of Jay Sharknado, I was able to get a clip. Now they're not moving the entire show over to FS1. They're moving in certain markets because of football now are moving SmackDown to their secondary channels. And my DVR did not make the move with them. So the people in Louisville, and I don't know how many other markets did not see SmackDown on their primary channel, which may be, depending on how many places this is happening, affecting their numbers artificially, would you think? Because people don't know until it happens. You would think, but also it appears that WWE, I mean, this wasn't a premium SmackDown. Well, if you had to miss one, this one might be the one. But, um... But anyway, it's being switched around, so we got that going for us. But thank you, Jay Sharknado, because I didn't find out until I checked in with my DVR and realized, oh, shit, it ain't going. But the opening of the show was, and I, there, is Grayson Waller becoming their version of Pockets? Are they just determined that they're going to act like this guy is a star until people think he is? It's kind of what he's doing, too. He's their Colin Thompson. To open the show with his phony bullshit talk show with the stock ticker graphic rolling at the bottom of the screen and the potted plants, and it's... He looks like Ned. It's ridiculous. Did you catch the line where he said Beth Phoenix, who was sitting in the front row because it's Edge Appreciation Night in Toronto... Uh, Beth, you should thank me for making Edge relative again. <laughs> anyway, he introduced Rey Mysterio and Pablo Escobar, and they VTR'd the history of Rey and Escobar and Theory and the U.S. title. And then Rey and Escobar speak to him, and he's trying to foment disagreements between them. It's not working. It got long and slow. Escobar is a very polite man. I zoned out on Escobar still calling Ray his friend and mentor. They re resisted the urge for Waller to wind them up against each other, but I zoned out until Theory came out because it was dragging. What about you? I mean, I was watching it, and he's very appreciative of Ray, and this Waller thing sucks, but I was waiting to see where it was going to go. They were opening the show with it. Well, it fi it finally went somewhere. Theory came out and brought the energy level up and cut a promo on everybody and demanded that Pierce come out and return his U.S. title belt. And then Pierce came out and was said about five words, and they hit L.A. Knight's music and got a big pop. And here comes L.A. Knight right past Pierce, and he milks the crowd. And there's a big L.A. Knight chant, and... They've got a guy riding the audio board because every time the crowd want, does something they want them to do, they turn it up. And every time somebody else starts to speak, they'll back it up a little bit so it's not obvious. And if they get crowd reactions they don't want, they'll turn them down. But it's there. 
They love some L.A. Knight. And he cut the promo on Theory. And, of course, since this is the WWE, he challenged Theory to a match where the winner gets a U.S. title match. And the fans say, yeah. And then Pierce makes it for right now. And suddenly Waller and everybody else is gone. And now we've got L.A. Knight and Theory with Miz on color. And honestly, I'm glad I got to see this because it reminds me there are guys out there that still have matches like wrestlers instead of, you know, aggressive parkour. It was a good back and forth match. I can't criticize it because it, it within the WWE framework, they did what they can do. They're athletes. They can work. They look great. They got personality. They were serious. L.A. Knight's got the babyface pizzazz going for him now where he bounced Theory's head off the desk over and over, and the people would say, yeah, every time, and then threw him into Miz's lap. But they move like wrestlers. They're doing spots. They're, they're boom, boom, boom. And finally, L.A. come back, back and forth, hit a DDT, chased Miz around, clotheslined him, even though Miz got stuck on the top rope. And as L.A. was doing that, Theory School Boyd him, pulled his trunks, one, two, three. L.A. Knight's right back up, but at the same time, he's like, motherfucker, but Theory gets that title match next against, well, now it's Rey Mysterio, and everybody's still involved. I like this part of the program, because it's our boys. What'd you think? Well, they're your boys. Again, I don't want to uh, associate anyone with me directly. I'm an independent operator. Oh, um, come on. You're a smooth operator. You know, Escobar, I don't have a problem with Escobar. And we'll see where they go with that. LA Knight versus Theory was intriguing, and they went right to it. I like Miz in this so far. Very short sample size. The stuff with him and LA Knight. I think we may have missed one Raw in between there. So maybe they've done something stupid. I don't know. Where they're going with LA Knight. And this is a way that he loses, but doesn't lose anything. Exactly. And then we get back to more regular SmackDown. Um, and they're celebrating Edge throughout this thing. And he's in Toronto, his hometown. And they have stars with comments about him and everything. And I get it's, I don't know what date it was. It was, um, well, it was 97 rather than 98. I saw his tryout match. I've told the story. His tryout match with the WWE or WWF then was against Christian Cage because they were friends. And it was definitely in Toronto. I remember that because Carl DeMarco was there watching the monitor and JR was whispering to me that he signed them both up for 300 bucks Canadian apiece a week. So, but that, uh, I guess they're counting his debut rather than the first tryout match that would have been 97. And I'm thinking it was in the big building in Toronto because they used to run the sky dome there even for house shows. Nevertheless, then we got Bianca and Charlotte versus EO and Bailey. And I don't know whether we're going to be talking about this 25 years later, but after about 15 minutes later, Bianca hit her finish on Bailey one, two, three. And then they followed it up in the back when Bailey and EO attacked Bianca and pummeled her leg with a chair. So everybody's even, right? Right. Nothing more to say about that? Right. Right. Gallows and Anderson against Private Profits. Or is it Street Sweepers? Or Street Party? Private... Who are these people? I don't know private if they, profits. I don't That's know if they right. party anymore now that they're with Bobby Lashley. Well, no, they're the street profits. The private party were with the Hardys, and they don't party anymore. No, one of them disappeared. Whatever happened to Mark Quinn? I, I'm sure he's hurt. He's he's way too athletic to not be hurt in AEW. The private folks won in about two minutes off of this. So I get Gallows and Anderson. Apparently, they're they've got some steam of some kind. Uh, we had a bloodline package about Jay quitting and et cetera, et cetera. And then Paul was in the back. The only member of the bloodline on SmackDown this week was Paul. 
who wouldn't answer any questions that Kayla asked him, was not going to address rumors. He, he basically said absolutely nothing and was great doing it. And then got a phone call and found out Jimmy Uso is going to be here live next week. So that's what's going on there. And we were at the main event. Edge versus Seamus. Seamus. And remember, they asked for this match last week. And our friend Seamus said, I hope you're not making a mistake. And there was some tease of some tension. Even though the cover story was they'd never wrestled each other. They always wanted to. They had a great background. He had helped Edge when Edge came back after the layoff due to injury, blah, blah, blah. So you just knew something was going to happen, right? Well, wrestling history would point in that direction, traditionally. Guess what happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. They had a good wrestling match. I'm not taking it away. Good wrestling. They're two professionals. It was a WWE presentation. They started the match, went under two minutes to the break. They came back, went four minutes, went back to the break. And they came back and did some good stuff and worked hard. And the fans were kind of booing Seamus by the time that he hit the Bowery Beats or whatever. And Edge, of course, the hometown boy, was getting the big cheers on the comeback. And the fans came up at the end. Seamus hit a kick and got a two count. And Edge dodged a kick and hit a spear and got a two count. And then Edge hit another spear and got a three count. And then they hugged each other. And then they went off the air. So apparently, for once, they told the truth. They just had this match because they were friends and they wanted to. And that was the name of that match. What do you think about the rumors that this was potentially either Edge's last match, period, or at least his last match in WWE? Well, I know I saw somebody on Twitter say, well, does that mean that Edge could go to Wembley Stadium? Well, no, for one thing. I don't think he's going to do that to a company that has made him a multimillionaire and he's worked for for 25 years on and off. Well, only off to be retired, not going to other promotions. I, I still don't think that even if it's the last match, perhaps, that he has under contract, I don't know that that means that he's free and clear of any obligations best still works for the company every once in a while i i don't honestly believe you will see that whether it would be possible or not but i don't think that he's technically free and clear of every obligation yet where he could just walk on to somewhere but why would you do that why, I don't why think would you have this as a last match? Is that what you're saying? Or why would you go to Wembley? Well, no, why, why would you end like this? He's had a 25-year run with the company. They're still using him prominently, and he, he gets a big send-off in Toronto, and 10 days later, he's at Wembley Stadium for the competition. I don't think he would do that. I don't think he needs to do that. I don't think the WWE is not giving him his notice or demanding that he retire. We haven't heard of any heat with him and the company. Uh, you know, I, I believe I heard that they con AEW contacted him, you know, before he ever came back to the WWE when he was still retired. And I can believe that because there's, there's other AEW talents that live over in Asheville, North Carolina. But he came back for the WWE. There had to be a reason he wanted to do that. I don't think he wants to, you know, get involved in whatever's going on over there right now. And I know you can say you never burn a bridge, but he can certainly get heat with a company that's done a lot for him. I don't think he's going anywhere. He might resign or he might decide to retire again now that he's done what he felt like he wanted to do. If he gets a crazy offer, but he brings it to WWE to match it or at least become aware of it before he accepted anything, does he still get heat? No, I don't see how you can get have heat with somebody for saying, hey, these chuckle fucks over here across the street are trying to offer me $3 million per match or whatever. Just, you, you want to give me an offer I can live with so I can tell them no and get them off my back, but I can't just go home and collect stamps, so do something for me. 
that kind of thing. And they probably like, remember Bret Hart. At first, he was willing to take less from Vince than he was from WCW because he didn't want to go. And then Vince ran him off anyway. So the lesson is never be nice to the promoter because they're going to fuck you in the end. Well, where would you rather be fucked? In the end or right up in your face where you have to look at it too? Well, that was SmackDown <laughs> and the career of Edge. All righty. Uh, what, what, by the way, speaking of careers and whether you're getting rear-ended or not, is happening over at the Arcadian Vanguard side of things this week. Oh, there's so much happening, so much, that I can only remember only a portion of it, but go through everything today. Find out information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. Of course, every single day, check out the wrestling news wherever you find your favorite podcasts, or directly from the wrestlingnews.com your daily free wrestling morning newscast all the news none of the opinions no star ratings get it today the wrestling news the wrestlingnews.com of course want to make mention of the latest episode of stick to wrestling with john mcadam a look at the 1988 morton downey jr episode with dennis carluzzo thunderbolt patterson Lou Albano, David Schultz, Jim Wilson, and a cast of thousands. What would you give to be in a room with all of those people at the same time again? You watch the audience and it's filled up with like every, everyone tied into the New York, New Jersey indie scene before there was one. They're all in that room <laughs> and they look like <laughs> fucking maniacs compared to the usual Morton Downey Jr. audience in Secaucus. They look like maniacs. But hear that today at McAdamPod.com or look for Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! Go through the archives today at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts, The Mothership. Well, Mother, it's time to talk about the mother of all wrestling television programs. Gather your little colliders around the fireside here, folks. We're going to have a fireside chat about Collision on August 19th from Rupp Arena in Lexington, Kentucky. And I just wish that I had a way to convey to the people, the cult of Cornet out there, the size of Rupp Arena on the inside of this fucking thing. The entire arena, it seats 23,000 for basketball. That's with no seats on the floor whatsoever. And I'm going to say that when they first opened it in 1978, it was built primarily for the University of Kentucky Wildcats to play basketball because that and the inaugural Rolling Stones concert, I'm going to say, was the only thing that filled it up for years. It's a huge building in Lexington. I don't know about today, but when we used to pay attention, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, because we were either trying to run it, running or thinking about running it, Lexington's a city of a couple hundred thousand people and it's got the college, right? So this is not like, it's a building as big as they have in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, whatever, for Lexington, Kentucky. And that's why I'd said a couple weeks ago when I heard they were running it, what the fuck? I know that Tony thinks he's over in college towns or whatever, but this is just it's ridiculous, and as you could see, they did a good job of, you know, dressing the place, but the entire upper deck was closed off and blocked off and darkened off or whatever, because that up there, it's all bleachers. It's not even individual seats. They got bleachers up in this. They can, they can seat 10,000 people in that upper deck alone. So what they did was they put a curtain down the middle of the building. And then they only opened up the floor and the lower bowl. And then they didn't put anybody on the side with the hard camera. And they had, but they still, you know, when you've got 4,000 people in a building that seats over 20,000, 
it it somewhat hampers the atmosphere. I know, you know, I I know that they they've got the money to rent these buildings, but I'm I'm confused as to why that they're not sticking to some place that they can. You know that arena down in Atlanta, out in suburban Atlanta, the Gwinnett Arena or whatever, places like that that are popping up now across the country, that seat 6,000, 8,000, maybe 10, and you could get in there and not only spend less on rent, but also it would look, it would be a better atmosphere, would it not, than these giant NBA buildings with a quarter or fifth of a house? When Vince couldn't get people in the buildings, he went to smaller buildings for TV again, Mid-Hudson Civic Center, whatever it may be. And I think with AEW, the question has been why they're running so many big buildings and scaling everything down. And sometimes it kills the, like you said, if you have that many people in such a big building, it's not going to sound as good as if you had less people in a smaller building. Yeah, it's the acoustics. It's, it's the way the guys feel. It it affects the way you feel when you're working. If you're in a smaller building that's full than a bigger building that's empty, even if there's the same amount of people, it's a different atmosphere. But nevertheless, perception is reality, says Vince McMahon, but the reality is, is that AEW is about to sell more tickets than any wrestling show in the history of the world in London and can't sell pussy on a troop train in the United States because they're going back to towns they've already been to. And this is not historically a product that stands up to repeat business because what's left to do once you've seen it? And now they've got the situation where people, if they buy a ticket to see Dynamite, they know they're not going to see certain top stars. And if they buy a ticket to Collision, they know they're, they're not going to see certain other top stars. So they've limited themselves, and they put the tickets on sale way far ahead of announcing a card or even names. And then, apparently from what we're hearing from the fans and what we've been able to deduce, a lot of times when they'll do these TV tapings, guys will do pre-tapes or be in packages and not appear in front of the people live. When they thought those people that bought those tickets thought at least we'll get to see these people in person because it's their show. So all that contributes to too often familiarity breeds contempt, not being a, a dynamite live event viewing experience to begin with, no pun intended on the dynamite, because it was too geared for television and then coming back too quick to the same place you've already been. Or in this case, they've never been to Lexington, and they shouldn't have tried the biggest arena in the state of Kentucky first. And I can't wait till they get to the Yum Center in November in Louisville and try to fill that 22,000-seat monstrosity up. Anywho, for Collision, we had the VTRs at the start of the, the words from the guys, Christian Cage, Darby, Bullet Club, Dalton Castle and Samoa Joe before we got Elton, and we got Kevin Kelly back. They let him out of Japan. Apparently, they reinstated his passport and told him to get the hell out. Can you imagine how insane I would go after 10 days if I was trapped in a foreign country and had to be there for a month? You know I can't see it happening. No, it, no, it, no my God. Anyway... And they start the program off with a bang. Here comes Samoa Joe. He's entering the ring. He's the Ring of Honor World TV Champion. He's the king of television. He's facing the already-in-the-ring golden vampire in a gold lame mask and bodysuit covered head to toe. And as soon as Joe gets to the ring, the golden vampire dives out of the ring and jumps on him and beats him up and shoves the referee down and throws Joe in, hits him with a knee, picks him up, gives him the GTS, boom, pops the mask, and it's Mussolini in gold lame. Oof. It was CM Punk all along. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, Samoa Joe. Because who would hunt after the golden elite, the golden vampire? That's right. And after he knocked him out and stood over him, he took the microphone 
And as you'll recall, last week, Samoa Joe choked Punk out and said, fight me, bitch. Well, Punk said, I accept, bitch. And he left. And if Now, that woke the people up watching television. It was a great deal with a big reaction. Didn't take long. A hot way to start. We've seen the fucking unexpected surprise with star of the program. What else can happen tonight? It's also good that they've established in the last few weeks that Samoa Joe's been wrestling squash matches. Yes, because now it made sense and, and other guys are doing it too. And the golden vampire didn't look any more ridiculous than some of these other job guys they found. So it didn't stand out like you knew that was coming. And though, of course, they got a pretty good idea after he picked him up for the GTS before he popped the mask, but nevertheless. But that starts out, okay, I'm good with it. It's an old wrestling angle, as old as the hills. A good way to start. Unexpected. Boy, we're off on the right track. <sighs> Remember a collision a few weeks back when we said, boy... The, it, the show was going good, and then there was about 30 or 40 uninterrupted minutes of the Bullet Club gold, and by the end of it, everybody had zoned out. Yeah, I remember that vividly. Did you feel like you got a flashback on Saturday night? You know what? Watching this, maybe a little bit, but I also think maybe Juice Robinson felt that way, too. It looked like he was trying to go for the mic a few times before Jay White was ready to give it up. Juice is trying to save this whole thing. And he's doing a good job. He, You yes. can't take your eyes off him. You listen to him. He's great. Here, the, the next match, the first legitimate match, was Jay White with the rest of the Bullet Club Gold, who is Juice and the Gun Boys, against Dalton Castle with the boys. And Dalton Castle was really over in Ring of Honor, I guess, about five or six years ago. I didn't see a lot of it. Heard a lot about him. The boys, the gimmick. Is it Adrian Street updated? Not really. There's elements, but it's flamboyant. It's over the top. <sighs> if this was different in AEW, it might work because it was different in Ring of Honor at the time that it worked. But half the roster in this company looks like a fucking clown show. It looks like the goddamn Volkswagen pulled up outside Ringling Brothers fucking summer training headquarters or winter quarters down in Florida, and a bunch of clowns jumped out. If half the roster is a parody of wrestling, especially on Wednesday nights, then Dalton Castle and the boys and the peacock feathers and the whole nine yards just adds to the cartoon atmosphere rather than setting him apart from the rest of the group and making him an attention getter because he's so more, much more flamboyant than everyone else. To me, that's the assessment. It, it's it, in, a, in, the, in the right context, the gimmick works, but here everybody is fucking over the top. So how can there be a top to go over is my question. What do you think of his gimmick? I've seen him before. I know he has talent. To me, the best part is the entrance. That's the part I get a kick out of the most. That's the part I enjoy the most. Wasn't crazy about his promo earlier in the show. That may have been the first promo I've heard him do ever. And I thought the match was okay. Yeah. And I mean, he's, he's a good wrestler and he's had back problems. He's strong. He's got an amateur background. He can do deadlift throws. That's probably why he's got back problems. But the match was okay, and then finally, Jay White hit a, some kind of suplex over on top of his head, didn't cover him, pulled him up, his limp body in his arms so that he could hit his finish on him, and then beat him one, two, three. So another modern, flat-as-fuck fucking finish. And when he hit his finish, it was sloppy. It was a long match. But then they go... I think they went to a break and then they came back and did an in-ring promo with the Bullet Club Gold. And this again, same thing that happened last time. Jay White did a long promo 
wandering around the ring, talking about Twinkle Toes, talking about all their various issues, while he was in the back of everybody, wandering around talking to the people in the arena while the floor camera in the ring, the handheld, was on Tony Schiavone, who was supposed to be doing the interview, and the gun boys and Juice, and the gun boys are doing distracting shit to take away from the stuff that Jay White is saying when Jay White's not that interesting saying it to begin with. And at one point, one of the guns was trying to stick Tony's finger up his own nose. And this went on. And I know somebody's going to point and say, well, the Midnight Express, Bobby and Dennis or Bobby and Stan, when you were cutting the promos at the TBS studios with Tony, they were smiling or looking at the fans in the front row or rubbing their title belts or whatever. Well, they weren't trying to stick the announcer's finger up his fucking nose while I was talking. Because that would have been distracting. And I was talking about shit that would get them over. So they didn't do that. And Tony was making funny faces. Like he was suffering these children and he was grossed out by the idea of his finger going in his nose or whatever the fuck. I don't know. He's working along with them. They're all childish. Juice jumps in and you instantly want to listen to him. He's got the voice and he's got the face and the way he says things. You instantly wanted to listen to him and he was very brief and then jumped back out of it. And then whether it's Jay White or whether it's the gun, but the guns are okay and I like their work and they've got tons of pep and enthusiasm. But this was, Jay White keeps trying to do the long promos and he shouldn't. And it just, eh, it didn't go anywhere particularly. And then suddenly, when we thought that was the end of it, out come the opponents because now they're going to have another match with the three Bullet Club Gold members we didn't see wrestle against three guys that we hope we never fucking see again. And regret that we were witness to the first time. Your thoughts on the promo, anything before I go to the match? It went long, and I thought maybe Jay White got lost. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's just his style of wandering around the ring while he does the promo. Couldn't wait for Juice to talk. And like I said earlier, it looked like he couldn't wait either. He was trying to get that mic before they were ready to give it to him. They should have just given it to him. Because you know what the other thing is? The way he talks, the way he acts, he hasn't done too much of anything yet. Jay White, I've heard too much of now. Yeah, yeah. Juice Robinson, we, it's a little bit and he's out. We've seen Jay wrestle enough now. We've seen or heard Jay talk enough now. We haven't seen Juice wrestle enough and we haven't heard Juice talk enough. And I think he ought to be the fucking, he shouldn't be the leader because he's, he's Bluto Blutarski. He's a fucking weird fucking second banana guy but he needs more focus on him because he's going to steal the fucking show when they do but anyway as the the promo was over with here's music and here come they used to be bear country and we saw them recently the iron savages and what is their little jacked up short manager muscle heads name j jonah jameson I don't know. I don't know what was happening here, actually. <laughs> okay, th these two fat fucking bearded hairy fellows, the bears, that are now the Iron Savages, have a manager that's a little muscle head on his own, but he's shorter. I think his name is J. Jonah Jameson or Jameson something or other. John and Jacob he, Jingleheimer Smith? Well, his name is your name, too. And they came out, and the short stooge was just screaming almost unintelligibly into the microphone. You could catch words where he was putting them over and, and introducing the, the, his group. That's not a bad thing, but it was so... He was not only screaming, he was gargling the words. He, they were trying so hard that he was almost ready to have an aneurysm. And... I wrote, these are the most annoying, unsympathetic, obnoxious baby faces that have ever been on a wrestling program. And the fans did not give a shit 
about this match because they hated the baby faces. They were not only bad performers, they were obnoxious human beings. So we had a six man with the guns and juice against Meathead Stu here that even went through a break. And that's where I said the gun boys, they're trying, and Juice is working his ass off. They tried as hard as possible to make something out of this, but the opponents were sloppy. They were bigger heels. And I thought that the guns and juice gave them too much in the match that they weren't capable of carrying, especially that big guy that planted both of the guns and then slammed juice on top of them. They're job guys. In case you ain't figured it out, they're there to get you guys over. You don't have to be that charitable with these guys that are the shits, that are too old, that ain't going to make it at this point anyway, and are there for cannon fodder for you to draw some fucking money. Be a little more prickish. You don't have to goddamn wipe them out in 30 seconds, but any of the three of these guys, or all of them, or any of them, throwing the alleged, one of the top alleged heel groups around was a little much. And the people hated it. And finally, Juice beat one of them and took them 10 minutes. Talk about the match. Well, this was the highlight for me. I have some audio here. This was one of the uh, Iron Savages making a reference to, uh, again, these are baby faces talking about the heel gun boys. Let's go to this. You can call me ass boy because I'm going to... <laughs> yes, he wanted to be called ass boy because he was going to motorboat the other guy's asses. <laughs> Those are my only other thoughts about the match. <laughs> you have to see the visual because he really like. Oh yeah, he's up. into it. <laughs> he's, I'm telling you, he's got sphincter on the brain there. What so was, even the uh, Nigel, I think it was, was like, "What was that?" Yeah, <laughs> Nigel was was offended. Blah, blah. <laughs> but that was fine. But then we had seen the Bullet Club Gold out there, pretty much uninterrupted for what twenty five, thirty minutes at that point. Yeah, it was too long, and it was too long, and it was matches that you. I mean, maybe some people in the Dalton Castle, but at least with this other match, if you weren't already predisposed to knowing who Iron Savages are or whatever their gimmick is, you may not have seen this as entertaining as... The Iron Savages' immediate families were not entertained by this. I don't care whether you know them or not. So anyway, then help me with what happened south of the border here. Because apparently Jose the Assistant is sitting there on camera making a phone call and he's talking to a guy in Spanish, and there's English subtitles, and was he talking to Rush? Or is he talking, who's he talking to? Uh, must be talking to Roosh, I would guess. Well, one or the other of them, either Rush or Roosh, whichever. But then, they go from the subtitles of the interview, not interview, but just the video of Jose on the phone, to on location in Mexico it, with a white guy who I believe, um, upon reflection, is that fucking Preston Vance character. Remember, he's rotten. And a lucha guy in a mask. I'm not sure which one. It wasn't Penthouse or Felix. I recognize their masks. They're in Mexico, and they're out partying and going to the tourist attractions. And this is on camera. And suddenly a van pulls up and guys in black hoods get out and put hoods over the heads of the Lucha guy and Preston Vance and kidnap them. And then the camera sees Jose still on the phone behind the van and he taps it for them to pull, pull off. And so apparently in AEW, we've, we've had road rage and we've also had aggravated kidnapping in a foreign country this week. Well, to be fair, that's just every five minutes in Mexico right now. But at least everyone brings a camera crew to document everything. So that so how did Jose go from the video of the phone call with the subtitles to the 
the guys in Mexico obviously seeing a camera shooting them because they were only eight or ten feet away from it. And then they got and and Preston Vance, he's a big old boy, but he sure fights like a pussy because he just got kidnapped pretty much like that. Like, okay, don't hurt me. And then Jose's behind the whole thing. You know, it seemed kind of phony to me. Like, that couldn't really happen like that. Why was it on collision? That's the problem. A lot of this stuff is not the stuff that we have grown to love from punk. It's the stuff we've grown to expect from the other punk, Tony Khan. The other punk. (laughs) So anyway, then... Ricky Starks told Tony that they were wrong. He was not suspended for one month. He was suspended for 28 days. There's a big, big difference there. And he's going to bring chaos to the program tonight. And they did a nice little video on Starks. And he looks different, very stylish. And then he came out with Big Bill. And I, before we talk about Big Bill's match, uh, the deal is he Stark's got a manager's license. He's going to be at ringside. He's going to cause chaos. Did we see a Shawn Michaels, Kevin Nash type of pairing with Big Bill and Starks? Is that Big Bill's spot in life? Again, Big Bill has almost begged to be used better, uh, at least in terms of how much he's improved. Should he, should he be Big Bill then or begging Bill? Well, I was hoping, actually, because this is a new thing, they would have changed his name coming out there. This would have been the perfect time to either add Big Bill Morrissey or something different. I will say he's in the best shape I've ever seen him in. I looked at the thickness of his arms. He's in great shape right now. He ain't bad in the ring. He seems to be taking it all very seriously. He's one of these guys we said we wish he was used better. Perhaps this is it. What do you, you, you think of Starks as the manager in that role? Well, see, that's the thing. Usually when it's something like this, they'll just have the guy be a manager of this guy this week and that guy the next week and that guy the next week. But again, with Big Bill, besides the rotten name, they've just been using him with job guys against job guys or with Cage. Remember that match with Cage against FTR? where He was in the firm. Needed- yeah, and in and, and that horrible group, they need to put attention on Big Bill, but he can't be the he can't be the star of the movie. He can be the supporting player. With Starks in the Shawn Michaels like role, he's a little prick, he's mouthy, he's talented in the ring, but he's got the big fucking asshole that doesn't do much but beat people up behind him, Kevin Nash. Well, this could be Big Bill. I would explore this further if they're not going to already maybe they are we don't know but i like the pairing because it makes big bill look more legitimate to be with somebody legitimate and it gives stark some backup because he's still not the biggest dog in the yard speaking of big dogs though the opponent was Derek neal and i'm in favor of squash matches i'm in favor of especially heels being able to go out and beat people up quickly and succinctly and get them over but why can't they find some good looking halfway experienced athletes to do these jobs that's what i was doing in ring of honor that's what i did whenever i had the the budget and or the contacts was find the guys that look good have gear are serious you know instead of I just whoever these fucking outlaw guys are that they're finding that look like shit. I like shitty looking jobbers, but you know, I'm from the Northeast. Well, and we and, had a lot and of that. They were back in the day. There was a bunch of them and boy on Atlanta TV too. And we could go on and on, but I've, that's always been a picadillo of mine and I've tried to avoid it when possible. And I would, you know, when, when you can use a guy like previous generation, but a guy like Sean Casey in Cincinnati always had a good-looking gear, boots, clean, always had a tan, always worked out, could work. If you went to Cincinnati, you called him. If you went someplace else, you called this other guy, Adam Pierce. He and Chris Daniels and those guys in Chicago in that area 25 years ago. I'm not saying Adam was any better-looking man, but he he looked like an athlete back then. Anyway... So they go to the Nick Wayne and Darby video. And at at least on the Saturday... Oh, and by the way, I'm sorry. uh, Starks, first of all. Starks 
after Big Bill won, Starks whipped the guy with Steamboat's belt. So they're carrying that on. He's still got the belt. He's whipping people with it. They don't forget about things on Saturday night. They carry them over. They follow up on them, for good or bad. Do you think that means Steamboat has to make a return? Not well, in a match necessarily, but just on the show? Well, it do, that's not necessarily what I'm talking about by following up. The, the thing is that he stole that belt from Steamboat, and he's starting to whip other people. Now he's, he's going to whip job guys, but then sooner or later, if they keep it up, then he'll whip a top guy, and then that top guy's going to take that belt away from him and try to whip him with it. You've got an issue. It's just, but it's not being forgotten about. He stole Steamboat's belt, whipped Steamboat like a dog, never whips anybody else, never touches another belt. That's forgetting something. And with the Nick Wayne and the Darby video, they're following up on shit and keeping it alive. I'm not sure about Nick Wayne. I, I th He's relying all on the gymnastics and being a boy wonder instead of being a sympathetic teenager that can sell Darby. As we will see later on in this program, Darby is tremendous at the underdog selling when he's in with a veteran that can lead the thing. And But the, the position they're putting Nick Wayne in with this, it's all with the acrobats, and they've already had him slice his head disturbingly deeply on a fucking phony pre-tape in his barn where you could tell that it wasn't legitimate. I don't know. This may be a little a little quick and also the wrong. I know he's in with all of his friends from Seattle, but God damn it. There needs to be there needs to be a veteran in this between Swerve Strickland, A.R. Fox, Darby Allen and Nick Wayne. There's nobody to teach them what not to do. <laughs> and that's probably what they need more than anything else right now. Yeah, AEW's not known for their restraint. Anyway, uh, the 9 o'clock hour, and this does not bode well for the ratings, which we will have on the drive through because it's a weekend. The 9 p.m. hour was Willow Nightingale versus Diamante. And Chris Statlander and Mercedes got in a big fight, and Willow won the match. I don't know who will win the ratings war with that at the 9 o'clock hour. Uh, did I miss anything? No. Good. Tony Storm in the back, dressed like Joan Crawford in 1936. I'm loving this. She is starting to become the Queen of England. The haughty accent, the the clothes, the the whole vintage look, the you know obnoxious, uh, down upon you looking attitude. I'm liking the whole thing. We haven't seen her wrestle in a while, but I like the promos. And she's she's very egotistical. She's been great in these promos. This week, her look was uh, over the top. Good job, though. And I thought her interplay with Lexi Nair, who doesn't get any credit, but she's like the best interviewer they actually have there. She she Yes, if they would dump Marvez permanently, Officer Barb Brady, and get her, she's fine. She actually acts like a human being with a pulse. Yeah, I mean, on... The Dynamite preview later in the show, it was like MJF's talking with Renee. They actually show her in the graphic like she's a draw. <laughs> Lexi Nair does a better job, and she doesn't need to be pointed at. Like, look who's here. She just does a really good job. So she's doing a Tony Storm interview, and it points out just that everyone doesn't need to be in a faction. And Tony Storm certainly shouldn't be in a faction. She stood out more from doing this over the last few weeks than she did in the group. She stood out more from doing this over the last few weeks than anything else she had done in AEW up to this point. And I think off camera, the next time she wears that outfit, off camera, there should be a child's voice going, Mommy, dearest, then she turns around, I told you no wire hangers. Awful. Then Powerhouse Hobbs wrestled a short dipshit covered in prison tattoos. Who was over? And he, he had to have been from... from Fucking Lexington, and I guess he just got out of the goddamn county jail over there. I have I have no idea who the guy was. I've never seen him. But the local people there loved him. But he looked like drizzling shit. And the match was one tackle pancake, one, two, three, obviously. And again, good to have squashes. Bad that the job guys look like this. But then Hobbs goes to put 
Miro's camel clutch on the guy, the Redeemer, and then Miro pops up on the screen and cuts a promo. And I wrote here, I never know what the fuck he's talking about, but he sure sounds like he means it. And in this, he said he will, if I'm not mistaken, this is the quote, now that he's, well, now he's finished with God. He's won that battle. And he's turning to Hobbs, and now, Hobbs, you want to redeem yourself? I will piss on your cold, dead body. So that's a pretty strong statement. Is that gimmick infringement? Is that sealing your pissing on Russo's grave? No, because I'm going to have the the kindness and the compassion and at least the, the manners, if nothing else, to let him bury the piece of shit first. I'm not going to piss on his cold, dead body just laying out on a parking lot somewhere. I'm going to let him put him in the box or let him put him in the box and say the words and bury him and put some dirt over the top and even plant some grass. And then I'm going to go piss on that and kill the grass. Do you think Miro would be so over the top and willing to say these things if everyone wasn't getting away with everything else in AEW? Well, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know. It's necessarily bad. It's just, I've still yet to, I wish somebody would sit down and say, okay, here's the, Here's the key to Miro's promos. Maybe they could write it and put it in the program. Once upon a time, Miro and God were on good terms. But then God forsook Miro because he gave him a neck of sand. And then somehow his hot double-jointed wife convinced him to split up with God because God wasn't doing him any good. And then he has won the battle with God, but now he is godless and he's going to piss on Hobbes. It all sounds great, but what the fuck is actually going on over at the Miro household? I don't know. It must be tough to date. I mean, he's lucky he's married. What kind of conversation can I have with him over dinner? Well, and then, you know, if, if, if he dates somebody that's religious and then he goes on the outs with God again, they may have to pick and choose. I don't know what's going on, but it sounds good when he says it. We'll find out what happens. I'm... I don't know if I'm looking forward to Miro against Hobbs because isn't that kind of like the Road Warriors versus Warlord and Barbarian? It's kind of the match you didn't really want to see. You want to see the big, mean guy throw around a little or nice guy or vice versa even. It's one thing if you build to it. This doesn't seem like much of a build. Well, at least QT wasn't there. Did you hear they put a belt on QT Marshall in Mexico? I read about that, yeah. So I imagine we'll see him show up with a title belt any time now, even though it makes absolutely no sense in the context of AEW. He'll be thrilled he has a belt and want to show it. And one thing, Tony always wants all the kids to show their new toys. Speaking of new toys, we taught a new toy some old tricks in the main event Darby Allen versus Christian Cage with Dino in the corner, Jim Ross in for the main event. I've said it before, Darby is always good with a veteran leading and calling the match. He's like some of the other guys where he's got a lot of talent. He just goes too far with these other jackoffs because they can. They can do it, so he thinks he should. But in this case, I think this was one of my favorite Darby Allen matches because. He saved all the dives for the end, and there weren't that many of them to begin with. He sold and got sympathy and showed his fighting heart. And the match made sense, and he fought from underneath, and Christian was the heel in control that would cut him off, but then give him a hope spot, you know, intermittently. And it, it was a long match for television. I mean, not as long as the six-man main events they've had lately, but they had probably 20 minutes. But it didn't get old because you like the kid when he when what he's doing makes sense and you're not screaming, why the fuck are these idiots trying to cripple themselves when it's a wrestling match? You can enjoy it. And Christian Cage, one thing about him, he's a master of leading a match with these guys and doing the littlest to get the most out of it. So I like that. Um, and basically, you know, he kept... Christian kept Darby's high-risk stuff to where you would remember the big things. They had a little fight on the floor, and then Darby set Christian in a chair, went to the top, and drop-kicked him off the top rope, 
Christian was in a chair, took a bump over backwards. Darby took a flat back bump to the floor from off the top rope, which was saved for later on the match and also shows you who the smart one is and who the kid is because Christian t took the, the pissy little bump that was safe and Darby on offense almost killed himself. But then Darby went for the coffin drop. Christian rolled to the apron, so Darby went to do it on the apron and Dino pulled Christian away and Darby landed on the apron. And then the referee kicked Darby out of ringside, but that's when Christian hit Darby with the title belt and covered him, but Darby got his leg on the ropes. And then Christian missed a charge to the buckle. And Darby put Christian on top and was going to do something, but Christian's sunset flipped him off and hit a spear for a two count. But he got a big pop when Darby kicked out. And then Christian went for his finish, and Darby rolled him up one, two, three. So after all that time, Darby got the Hail Mary win by being more cunning and resourceful than this Bond villain that he was wrestling. And it was a good match, and Darby only had to threaten to kill himself once or twice in the course of the thing to get it over. And it was a good match. And Darby's got the special shit that the other... He's smaller than the other guys, and he's more reckless, and he's more durable, apparently. And that's why all these other jack-offs ought to be told not to do his shit, because he can get over even better with it. But then, Tony gets in the ring to interview Darby, and at All Out, it's going to be Darby against Dino for the TNT title. Now, that's not All In, that's All Out. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And as soon as that is said, here comes Christian and Dino back in, and they beat up Darby, and Christian covered him, and they made Tony Schiavone count the, the pin on Darby, which uh, eh, was kind of a eh, way for me to end the program. I didn't like that at all with Shivani. Well, they're just using him as a stooge, and he's not he's not believable as the 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 person being put upon. You can tell that he's going along with it and he's uh, okay. But why do the announcers like that? It's not necessarily necessary. But having said that, um it wasn't as bad and amateurish as Wednesday nights, but it was not an exciting episode of Saturday nights collision that we have come to be accustomed to past the shock at the start and the good main event what'd you think i thought it was an underwhelming episode with a few good moments i think they needed to do something about ftr they needed to address it or say that they weren't going to address it yeah but when they also announced that ftr would be heard from on the show and then it's just in the midst of that video package about them and the bucks that's misleading you had to hear something, even if it was you saying you couldn't say anything. I think there had to be something here. Yeah, and I remember now where the, I remember skipping the because it was a package about the Bucks, and I didn't want to see it, so I skipped that. But in the middle of that was, what, 15 seconds of comments from them. You didn't see them. You only heard their voices over the clips. Well, in that case, I missed the whole goddamn thing then. Well, that was Collision, the week before uh, this big pay-per-view event. Speaking of which... The weeks before these big pay-per-view events, because we haven't been driving this home, which we will here in a second, but Wembley Stadium All In is August 27th. Actually, is it the 26th over there, and it'll be the 27th over here with the time difference, or how? The, what the fuck's going on? Or is it all the same day? Sunday, August 27th. Uh, it's all the same day. But then one week later, we'll be all out. Another pay-per-view from Chicago, right? That is their scheduled fall pay-per-view. And that actually has been their big event because All Out was the one that replaced, not replaced, but took over for the original All In when they wanted right. to do it every year. But now they're going to be in and out in the space of a week. <laughs> in and out. <laughs> yeah. And they may be fucked by being in and out because we, we're just now finding out what the Wembley Stadium matches are. But now they're having to announce stuff for Chicago the week after at the same time. It's going to be a little confusing, but more importantly, again, how much money do people have? And if they're going to pick and choose, one would think they would pick Wembley Stadium because of the happening. And at the same point, to be honest, 
if you're if he knew when he did Wembley Stadium, they had to know they were going to broadcast this in some form or fashion. Why could Wembley Stadium not become all out? Why could that not be the big fall pay-per-view, the big fall show? Did they not have a clue who was going to air what, when, how? Why? I don't understand. Was this the plan to have two pay-per-views within seven days, including one of them being the biggest show in the history of wrestling? There's not a lot of rhyme or reason to what's done in AEW. And then they hope for the best, as you said previously on the drive-thru. Tony's received a lot of gifts from his father, from the fans. The period of time where everyone overlooks everything is kind of gone. And it's easy to look at everything happening domestically or in Canada and go, oof. But then there's Wembley. And there's all these tickets that were sold before any matches were announced. And then the matches were announced. And now it seems like a lot of people, potentially people who spent all this money to go to Wembley, are somewhat disappointed, and you can understand why. Well, you can't peak, especially with the shortage of talent that they have. I'm not talking about shortage of roster members. I'm talking about shortage of top talent that people actually care about, that people watch on purpose, go to see on purpose. You can't peak that many programs and angles to peak two weekends in a row for two separate shows with two different lineups. It's just, it's almost not possible. What if, the, and, oh, go ahead. Well, I'm just going to say, and if they didn't know how Wembley was going to be telecast, I would have at least held off or, you know, uh, tried to postpone the idea of doing a big show the following week until I sorted that out, rather than just saying, well, we'll just do both of them. But go ahead, what were you going to say? Unless you planned, and I'm not saying this would be a sound plan, unless you planned to have something really big happen at Wembley and then followed up on Wednesday on TV to lead into Chicago. I'm not saying that'd be the best idea, but if you did, again, it's not going to happen. Well, but they but did if they that. did Bucks and CM Punk, if they did something at Wembley to lead into Chicago, that whole week, everyone in wrestling will be talking about that. Remember, Vince did that 30 years ago. He switched the title, controversial deal involving Tuesday The in Undertaker Texas. this yeah. Tuesday in Texas. They did a Sunday and then Tuesday instead of the replay. They had a see back then the pay-per-view would air on the Sunday, and then the replay would be available two days later on Tuesday. That's why not only did they redo the Beware of Dog pay-per-view where the power went out in South Carolina the following Tuesday with a brand new show, but they did the This Tuesday in Texas because instead of doing the replay, they did a whole brand new show. And you remember nobody bought the goddamn This Tuesday in Texas. It bombed. Now, different fan base, different consumer, different way people consume and different way different different way people spend money. Yeah, but more people were watching, more people were buying pay-per-view, more people more of everything was going on 30 years ago than it is now. It still didn't work. Again, using this example and it's extreme, if you did something to light up Bucks and Page against FTR and Punk and think, go to Chicago. And go to Chicago, do you think it, that week would make it worth it? Could you do it? It Here's the thing. You have one week then. I'm sure Chicago will be sold out, but if it, well, maybe the way things are going, maybe not. If they did that, Chicago would be turning them away. But I don't, that still may be, it's obviously not going to happen. But if they did it that quick, it might be throwing away pay-per-view revenue, where if they beat it to death on TV for the next three or four weeks, they may do significantly better on pay-per-view streaming whatever because more people would find out about it instead of just the dedicated audience that's going to know everything it might be quick to turn that around and do that on pay-per-view like that but i mean they throw away other opportunities why not throw away that one but it's still not going to happen because even though it would as i said turn people away in chicago and get a ton of interest from the hardcore devoted fans the Buckaroos and Hangnail would have to work with 
goddamn guys that beat them up that they're upset about or they're mad at. And they ain't going to do that just because it's business. Well, why don't we look at this card? And again, maybe something will jump out to you as something that is apparent that would lead into the big pay-per-view a week later in Chicago. Oh, boy. And and by the way, just as we're previewing Wembley Stadium, and they've, they're they saying it's either going to be number one or number two at this point on all-time paid crowds, I'm not taking the piss out of it when I say this. Does anybody out there think that it's the product that sold these tickets, or is it the statement that the fans buying these tickets made. It's a happening. The UK fans are making it Woodstock. They've sold more tickets than Austin versus The Rock. Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock in the hottest period ever in wrestling. They've sold more tickets than that without announcing anybody to be on the card. Because it's not about who's on the card or what the card is. It's where the card is, the statement that the fans going to the card are making by going. We want a big event in the United Kingdom. Fuck you, Vince McMahon, you're the evil empire. Tony Khan is our friend, even if he does wank dogs. Whatever their goddamn thinking is over there, they were determined to make this a thing, a happening, and it's now self-fulfilling prophecy. And now. Like you said, to be honest, to sell all those tickets without them knowing a card or a match, and now when they, they're they finding out about it, all they've got to do now is bitch and complain. Well, they should have given us a better card. That's the, there's all, oh, that, that's the only place to go is down. Because it can't be as good as they had it in their minds when they thought... AEW and Wembley Stadium will see Twinkle Toes wrestle Will Ostrich on a cloud five miles above the ring. <laughs> see, it can't be as good as they dreamed it was going to be because they're fucking insane. They're all insane, and they've they've got they've gotten wrapped up in hysteria. And now they've sold eighty thousand tickets, and there you go. I'm sure most people will like the show just fine. There probably will be some people complaining. We'll probably be amongst them. But they're never going to do it again. It, this is never going to happen again until the WWE announces WrestleMania at Wembley Stadium. For two nights. For two nights, and then they'll do it. But AEW, in the meantime... Couldn't draw 15 cents in Chinese money in this country, and they're going to have to come back to reality a week later. So let's talk about the Wembley Stadium card. And again, there may be more matches added. Who knows what's going to happen in the next week? But the first match listed for the zero hour pre show event, 5 p.m. in London, noon Eastern time, for the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Championship, the champions Aussie Open versus MJF and Adam Cole. I think the only reason to have this is to further their issue. So they're either going to win the belts or turn on each other in that match, and I would imagine win the belts. Because that will be a red herring for what's going to happen later on that night, unless they've got some goddamn thing dreamed up with Roderick Strong and the Kingdom and whatever. But Kyle. <sighs> Kyle O'Reilly, maybe. Then again, you know, they're breaking up they're breaking up that old gang of ours, breaking up MJF and Cole at this point. It may not be good for the ratings. I don't know. We'll see. Somebody's got a brilliant idea somewhere in there. We'll see if it comes across. But I predict they'll either win the belts or break up in that zero-hour match, and my money's on winning the belts. It's even more intriguing than if they win the belts and then go into the match not knowing what's going to happen. But then also, if they do break up, you can have a tournament to crown new Ring of Honor tag team champions, and that way Tony gets another tournament. Well, Jim, another thing that Tony loves is the next match. In a stadium stampede, <sighs> the Blackpool Combat Club and three mystery partners versus the best friends, Orange Cassidy, Eddie Kingston, and the Lucha Brothers. 
Jesus H. Christ. Wait a minute. How many of those is there? The Lucha Brothers, Eddie Kingston. Six on six. The Puddin Gate. It's, I thought it was five on five before. Now it's going to be six on six? Six on six with three mystery partners to be added. Oh, boy. I'm sure they'll all be Japanese. So that way all those people will get a giggle. Uh, the BBC is going to win because they can't not win the big brawl in the arena. And I'm sure that they're going to, in the process of doing that against a bunch of fucking mid card guys and outright job guys like the Puddin Gang, they're going to do all the shit that the later matches that people paid to see could have done, but they'll do it first. So it'll diminish the main events. Well, and again, let me just say, we don't know the order of matches. We're just going based on the order well, that they, they are here on their website. You think the Puddin' Gang is going to main event Wembley Stadium? Tony's not even that fucking demented. Well, speaking of dementia, the next match listed, Jim, Chris Jericho versus Will Ospreay. Well, there you go. I predict, um, I don't know. They may want to make the people happy. Ostrich might win. Or they may want to make Jericho happy and Jericho will win. I'm up in the air on that one. It's going to be a real test for Ostrich dealing with Jericho and the fact that Jericho always tries to do stuff that he physically can't anymore. Could be interesting. I hope uh, Ostrich is a member of AAA, the automobile club. He'll need it to call a record to pull fucking Jericho up on a top rope after 10 minutes. I don't know if they uh, do things in England, AAA. The American Automobile Club, not in England? Well, that's a travesty. Well, I don't know if the next one will be a travesty, but Jim, for the real world championship, the real world champion CM Punk versus the Ring of Honor TV champion Samoa Joe. Looking forward to this one. I do not believe that the title will change hands because there's still the big unification to be done down the road. I think that Punk will edge this out, but I think it'll be a slobber knocker, as they say. I'm a big fan of Joe's also, and they've got history, and they work well together. In a big trios match, mm. Kenny Omega, Hangman Adam Page, and Kota Ibushi versus Kanosuke Takeshita, Jay White, and Juice Robinson. Again, I wish we hadn't got jacked out of uh, another match between FTR and Jen and Juice, which was nothing but a classic, two classics, uh, just to feed the ego of Twinkle Toes and his little fucking friends and Adushi. Adushi's got to be there. But, you know, there's, there's always next time. Gin and juice are wasted. That's my comment in that match. Who gives two shits? So is Takeshita. And Takeshita. Or take a shit, as most people know him. I don't know about most people, but Jim, most people may be looking forward to the next match. A coffin match. <laughs> Darby Allen and Sting versus Swerve Strickland and A.R. Fox. You know, again, Darby and Swerve and A.R. Fox are friends and they're going to do all the combative gymnastics. And poor Sting, I hope they don't talk him into doing something else to show that he's still one of the fellow kids and he hurts himself. And Darby and Sting, obviously, will be going over. Is this the entire card? I mean, there's a couple more matches here, but I'm looking. I'm, there aren't that many, I guess, names not on the card. Wow, this may be the whole show. For the AEW Women's World Championship, the champion Hikaru Shida versus Soraya versus Tony Storm versus Dr. Britt Baker. Adam, they've got two hometown girls in that one. Well, Tony, I'm hoping, well, let me stop you, because we're getting a lot of criticism. You are specifically. Lately. I am? What About what now? Confusing England with Australia, at least with accents, or New Zealand with Australia. Is Tony from Australia? This is where it gets confusing. Someone sent me something that said she was like half British, half Australian, but grew up in New Zealand. Or something was like, we can't win. Well, God damn it. She's closer than Poughkeepsie. Point is... They may be tempted to give Soraya the win because that's her. Uh, is she any more popular over there than she is over here now, which is about as popular as crotch rot? I, don't, I can't speak to the popularity of crotch rot in England right now. No, I'm talking about uh, Soraya. S same thing. Okay. Well, anyway, if she's popular over there, even if she's not, they may think she is. They may want her to win, but 
I'd put it on Tony Storm. She's actually standing out. She does never going to sell a fucking ticket. Goddamn one. Not one single one. Not even half a one. Not even one torn in half. And Dr. Britt's old news, she's been there. I'd put the thing on Tony Storm. She's different. Put it on Tony. Have her beat Soraya. That's the end of the outcasts. There you go. And they're mad and they don't want to speak to each other anymore about that. Jim, for the AEW World Tag Team Championship, the champions FTR versus the Young Bucks. Well, we talked about that earlier in the program. If this is a standalone clip, I will just reiterate my thought that I don't care what business dictates. I don't care what common sense dictates. I don't care what would make money for AEW or be the right thing to do. There is no way that the Buckaroos are going to lose this match in front of the biggest crowd of all time. They think their shit doesn't stink. They legitimately believe that they're this great tag team that has outperformed everybody in the history of tag team wrestling. They're convinced of that. And they're going to want to win this. And they're going to fly their families over and get them to fucking watch and cheer and take pictures and blow noisemakers when they win the rubber match from FTR and they establish themselves as the best tag team in front of the biggest crowd of all time, even though they're consistent ratings losers, they're consistent life losers. And now, with cash in trouble, that may give, you know, give them more ammunition to tell Tony, oh, we got to do it this way. But they were going to do it that way to begin with. Maybe you shouldn't refer to ammunition when it comes to this. Well, okay, I didn't, I didn't mean to, to pun that either. But you know these two smarmy, fucking self-obsessed little pricks are going to want to win this match. They're not going to want to do the right thing for business. FTR is a better tag team than the Young Bucks. Everybody knows it. Everybody's seen it now. Everybody's realized it. People are tuning out the Young Bucks on TV. Nobody buys tickets to see them. They're on the show because they were there because Tony was stupid enough to allow them to come in with the big boys. And now he's stuck with them, and he couldn't lose them because he already lost Cody and had made him look bad. And now they're going to say, oh, but Tony, we got to win on the big show because they genuinely believe that they're somehow good. And they're not. They're woefully not. But that's what's going to happen in that match, mark my words. Well, I think they've been exposed greatly in the last couple of years. And again, people dive out of the TV show when they're on, minus Kenny Omega. When Omega's there, people will stay. But it's the Bucks themselves that are the problem. Jim, finally. For the AEW World Championship, the champion MJF versus Adam Cole. This, I don't know what the fuck they're going to do. I don't believe that Adam Cole will come out of this as the world champion. I don't see why that would be a thing that should be done. I think they've still got money, proven money, with proven draws that can talk people into watching TV and then talk people into the building if they eventually unify between MJF and Punk, the title Punk never lost versus the title that MJF holds now, and Adam Cole winning it would complicate that. I know a lot of people are friends, so you may want to do things with your friends more than you want to make money, but the money match is still Punk going back for the title that he never lost, and so uh, something's going to happen, but I can't see the belt switching hands. Help me out. What do you think? I genuinely don't know. It's either where we come out of this event, MJF still champion, him and Adam Cole are still friends, or the exact opposite. Comes out of it and Adam Cole and him aren't. Either MJF suddenly turns on him, swerve, MJF's aligned with Roddy, something. Our Adam fucks over MJF, teaching the longtime heel lesson while he's become a softer MJF and accepted by the fans. <clears throat> I just don't know if I could see Adam Cole leaving Wembley Stadium as the AEW World Champion. Now, I'm sure they want to produce a big moment. I mean, we're assuming this match will go on last because it's the World Championship match, but maybe that's not a fair assumption. They're going on first with the pre-show, these two. I really don't know what they're going to do. I, I, oh, I think the Buckaroos will put themselves on last also. 
I really, they'll say, well, it's not fair for two guys to follow four guys because we do all the flips and Max doesn't flip. And that way they get to be the main event also. Well, that's AEW All In in London. Uh, real quick, Jim, All Out in Chicago a week later, two matches have been announced. <laughs> for the TNT Championship, Luchasaurus with Christian Cage versus Darby Allen, and Miro versus Powerhouse Hobbs. Well, I'd love to see a rematch of Christian Cage against Darby Allen. I'm not interested in seeing the dinosaur wrestle ever. The perfect use of him is to stand there behind Christian and look like odd job behind Goldfinger in the Bond movie. A prehistoric Big Bill. Yes. If you put him in the ring and have him wrestle, it's going to fucking suck, and it's going to suck hard. And uh, the other match was Hobbs and Miro, and we talked about that a minute ago. I'm not... It's a natural thing. It's Mark booking to see the, the, you want to watch the giant fight the giant. But sometimes those matches don't turn out. I'm not sure that Hobbs nor Miro, either one has the experience that can keep both guys as good as they need to be when they're throwing each other around. But we'll, we'll find out. It's not going to be Steamboat against Flair. No, it's not going to be JYD versus Flair either, but that's all out following all in. And this is an exciting couple of weeks for AEW. We'll see what happens. Are we all out now? I time? think so. Yes, yes, yes. Folks, we're out of time. Come back in a couple of days, if you dare, for the drive through and then next week for the experience and all the other things that we do on YouTube and everywhere else in between. And until then, in parting, we want to wish you love, peace, and soul, and fuck you, bye-bye, everybody.